I didn't become a minister by chance. I studied, I understood my sector, tourism, culture, sports, communication was easy. Today on the Valentine Jiroga show, we meet Archie Ojani Alai, an advertising executive who'd, who's worked all over this planet, raised her family while globe trotting, and then brought everything home to work in the public sector as Waziri in the Kisumu County government. She speaks to us today about leadership in the public sector, leadership in the private sector. Are there differences? Is it challenging while you are a woman in leadership in different ways? How did her children cope? How has she managed relationships as she moves around so much? Let's meet Archie. My name is Valentine Jiroge, and this show is focused on women in business who are business founders, business leaders, leaders in the corporate space, in the government space, policy makers. And we're having in depth conversations with these women. What does it take to create female success? What have their journeys been like? That's the conversation we're having. And today we are at Ducet Princess, which as you can see is a gorgeous hotel, beautiful views. They have so much to offer. They're on Church Road, a few meters away from the expressway. So if you have guests coming in from out of the country, they can be here literally in minutes. And um, they have an amazing business lunch, which we'll tell you more about later. And beautiful rooms, very centrally placed. It's a great place to be. That's Ducet Princess on Church Road in Westlands. And today we're meeting Wild Ziri Achi Alai Ojani Ojani Alai Achi A O A Aha Achi Ojani Alai Achi Ojani O A O A remember Nice So introduce yourself tell us a bit about yourself in yeah. a nutshell It's one of those hard questions isn't it your <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I've been with myself for a long time so okay. here we go my name is Achi uh -huh. um, Ojani Alai and Ojani dad Alai Habi um yeah, I am an amalgamation of parts. This is what I think most women are. Okay. Uh, we just don't say it that way. But uh -huh. um, grew up in Kenya, actually just pretty much downstairs from the Dusit. That's where home was here on Church Road. And I went to Consolata Primary. Oh, so did I. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> Westland, Westland, Westland's Consolata. girl. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, and then I went to Loretta Convent Musangai. Okay. And then I went to the University of Nairobi. That was a culture shock, but maybe the best three years of my life. And um, I've never had anyone say that yeah, about the University maybe of the Nairobi. Best three years of my life. And, and it was just, I'd never been to boarding school. Okay. Um, I was meeting. Uh, students like me from all over the country and that's also oh, different because okay. you go to private schools you only meet a certain um, clientele maybe okay. or a certain I don't know how to put it politely and now you go to UON and everybody's there mm. and it's just fantastic it really was a fantastic three years my father was a professor mm -hmm. uh, of geography at the University of Nairobi so of course I would meet him ever so often when I'm behaving properly or badly <laughs> My mother uh -huh. was uh, Kenya's second CEO of a government parastatal. She was running the catering levy trustees and she was now she was in the office that is now the vice president's office. So I know that building very well, she's on the fourth floor. So wow. And so that we grew so, up with So that. this female high achiever thing, it's not yeah. new to you. No, you're not, you're not like even, slot right in, yeah, continue. It's plug and play. <laughs> okay. Because that's what you saw, and as a kid, you know, you take what you see. Mm -hmm. So it when I hear the conversation about um, female leadership, I just think, well, I guess all my life, I just, that's all I saw. It was modeled it was, for you. Mom was doing her and dad was doing him. And I watched these two corporate giants and academic giants trying to raise a family and do their careers. It just I, really was like, oh. I'm shadowing them. And I know many of my, my brothers and sisters, that's all we saw. So okay. you kind of just replicate And you're you six saw. of you. We're six. I'm number one of six. I've, uh -huh. got four, I've got three sisters and two brothers. Okay, and yeah. Cece is the baby. She's the last one. Okay, yes. because she's yes, yes. she spoke at Dada Sphere, which All is, right. yes, of course, you yeah. know, this is how yeah. I met you. This is how you <laughs> met me, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Cece's the baby. Yeah. So um, what? how do you go from that to being an expat? What happened there? Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I finished at the University of Nairobi. I studied economics, and there was an ad in the newspaper, um, the Nation newspaper, mm -hmm. and they were looking for graduate trainees. It, it tended to be, uh, a little bit before you graduated from campus, mm -hmm. um, all the corporates and government would be advertising for jobs. Like, mm. I would say three months before graduation day. 
And so a lot of that's how a lot of students applied for jobs. Mm -hmm. You chose to go into the public service. You chose to go into the private sector. Um, I applied for a job. I remember it was Gillette, uh, the men's shaving brand. And I got that job as a graduate trainee. Mm -hmm. So I went there first. They were in the industrial area. And it was, you know, um, let me go back a bit. Before going to university, we had four months out from the time you finished school and before uni opened. Mm -hmm. And in those four months, I took an internship or rather... The good parents thought, well, we're not having her idling around. <laughs> so I learned two things. I learned computers. That's what you did. And I learned how to drive. Okay. And then I went for my internship. And so I was at Kenya Reinsurance. And mm. I was, I remember I was an insurance clerk. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew I will never do this. I'm not a behind the scenes kind of person. A data entry. Like, yeah, no. <laughs> back office was uh -huh. not me. But I think that's why people do internships and attachments so that mm. you can just see what do I like, what do I not it's like. It's true. And what does the industry offer? What is it like to be an adult working? And stuff like that. So I worked at Kenya Re and knew I wasn't coming back there. And so when I got the Gillette job, I was like, from the first day, I was like, yeah, this, this can be me, you know, marketing and branding. Mm -hmm. So as a trainee, you're moving around the entire... Uh, industry from finance, you spend some months there, you move on to marketing, you move mm. on to research, you move on to production, you're on the factory floor with them. The workers would come in at 5 a.m. And when you were on your three month shift with them, you were there at 5 a.m., you were just on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. So you learned how things are made, mm. how they're assembled, uh, what does it mean? The idea being when you're a graduate trainee or a management trainee, at the end of your traineeship, and at Gillette was 18 months, you then would see where you want to fit or okay. you know, HR would decide. So anyway, one of the three-month slots that I had was to work in the advertising agency for Gillette. The advertising agency was McCann Ericsson. So I did my three months at McCann. And there I really knew then this, this is me. This oh. is what I want to do. So when the internship was over, um, not the internship, the uh, trainee. The training program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also asked you, uh, Gillette was an international company, I travelled abroad with them for two trips, Zimbabwe and to London, and yeah, I said I want to work on the advertising side. So, uh -huh. just like that, I moved to McCann, and never was an employee of Gillette again for a season. So then I joined the advertising world, McCann Ericsson, mm -hmm. and again, they were in industrial area, and it was fantastic. My clients were Unilever, um, Barclays Bank, Safari Park Hotel. Oh. Things like that. So, and, and my boss was a female. Okay. And so, again, I, I didn't struggle with her being a female because it's mm -hmm. hard. Women struggle. Women are not necessarily best bosses to females. I do know some women yeah. who are like, I can't work for a female yeah. boss. And I think, because I saw mum, uh -huh. and then now my first boss is a, a, a woman. Well, not the first. My first was a gentleman, uh, Mr. Edwards at Gillette, and now a lady. And ladies push ladies mm -hmm. pretty, pretty hard. Um, I've yeah. thrived under female bosses. So, have I. so, so have I. I, when I find that comment interesting, I'm like, do you, when people say I can't work for a female boss, I'm like, is that you having an issue or no? Is it... I think I think, mm -hmm. and even in my season as being a leader, I, we can be very rough mm -hmm. because we want the results, right? And we we're slacking is not part of our DNA, and we're judged differently, <laughs> and we're judged differently, mm -hmm. and I wonder whether we're judged differently or we think we're being judged differently, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that a little bit. So. What I found with my lady boss, she was the overall general manager, and then my immediate boss was a lady as well. And it was fine. Mm -hmm. It was fine. I, I thought there was much more understanding when you were a bit sloppy. You know, when uh, female leadership is difficult because women go through the period, mm -hmm. and that affects us. Men know that, women know that. It when you say the, the period, mood. did you mean menopause? I am talking about menopause. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and, I, and I don't, and I, and I find it irritating when women leaders dance around that thing. Mm -hmm. Must be talked about because men are fathers, men have wives, men have daughters, you know. Right. It's, just, it's just what it is. Or maybe I've lived in Europe too long. You just and also talk. you've been, usually you become a leader in your 40s and that is perimenopause, menopause. That's the season. 
Uh, no, 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 not, not for, not for but everyone. Not for everyone, but in, in general, yeah. perimenopause starts at some point in your 40s. It could be 41, it could be could 49. Be 50s. Um, 50s, yeah. But then um, you're going through the actual change. Like, but I'm talking you know, about period. Uh -huh. uh, earlier, you're a young girl, you're in your 20s. Oh, that's what you, you mean? Graduated. Like you're just your monthly period. And, yeah, okay, okay. And, and that comes with mood swings and, okay. and pain. Mm -hmm. Pain. Let's deal with pain. The girl is in the office because she cannot take two, three days off every month. Right. She's in pain, physical pain. Right. Right. One, two. She's losing uh, fluid and mm. it makes her tired and exhausted. And so she behaves differently as a professional okay. in her job oh, that's at certain meant. times mm -hmm. of the month. And that empathy is what I found women don't give. Because you're a woman too, so you know what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, we've got to say it for what it is. It makes a lady a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more touchy. Mm. And then she's missing work, one, two, three every month you know it's tough so but you're matched against a guy and performance is performance but if there's empathy um from your boss your female boss and the men boss uh, it helps the women climb so mm, true that's a that's a that's a whole conversation right there but uh i then worked in my camps in in kenya and i loved it it was fantastic then my client was gillette okay the very one that i had been uh, training with for eight right. months so that was fantastic so what was that about? That was long days, good money. Uh, I bought a car very early on. I was very young. And uh -huh. I was very excited about that. I, I can see you in yeah. your 20s thriving. You see me with my with your... <laughs> right? T Y 466. <laughs> okay. And, uh, wow, we still remember the number oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You never forget your first I, car. I love that. Your first car is like your first love. Mm -hmm. So you never forget. It's independence. So, yeah, it's I can it's go, new. I can do it. Right. And my parents live in Loresho. Okay. And I'm going to the area. I don't have to wait for mom. And... There were no Ubers and mm -hmm. all of that. But um, because I had seen how we were growing up at home and dad and mom and their work ethics, they would come home and there would be chill time and da-da-da-da. But oftentimes there was a study in room mm -hmm. in, in all the houses we've ever had, even in shags. So they would, whoever would go to the study. And if you're stuck with your homework, you would go to the study and maybe mom's working. And, Hi, mom, I don't know how to do this maths. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they would help you or dad. Um, yeah. I also grew up um, most of my life with, we had a gardener, his name was Gekera. Mm -hmm. And Gekera was there before I was born. And so he was also part of, I don't know how to do this man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he would help us along the way. And you know, nice. he was very much part of our family. So that was my cans. Okay. And so I was dealing with brand development. You know, how do you market and, and promote brands that are stuck, that are having issues, that are coming mm. into the market. And so you looked at a brand holistically pricing product placement you know all those mm -hmm. distribution yes, yes. yes the seven p's i hear now they're nine mm -hmm. and um that was it and i loved it i was very good at it and i and i like the long hours um i like the diversity because one time i'm you know one morning maybe i'm dealing with gillette mm -hmm. in the afternoon it's the unilever meetings tomorrow it's the launch of safari park or you okay. know so there was that then there was the media the TV stations, the right. radio stations. So every day is different. Every day was totally it's fast different. paced. It's very, very fast. You're mm -hmm. dealing with the creatives who work with you. And Moody. you're trying to. Yeah, <laughs> but, but pretty cool uh -huh. too. You know, really, really cool. And production, how do you make films? How do you right. make. So it was so robust. Okay. No day was the same. You had to interface with government because you always had to go and get Reg approval from the oh, government. regulations that this and ad mm -hmm. is okay. It doesn't offend any values of the Kenyan people. It had to be approved by. I think those days we used to take it to Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. You're kidding? Yes, because you were not allowed to release an ad, an ad out into the public domain that was against our values as a Kenyan people. That is so interesting. It had to be checked. Does it tick the boxes on religious sensitivity on? Um, relationship sensitivity, uh, sexual stuff was very much suppressed. And, Compare that with today. You're on your phone. You're your own publisher. You yeah. regulate yourself. No. You no, no, no. It was very controlled, and you could. Sp and then that's when you're sending the the the, the storyboard. Uh -huh. So it's not that you filmed it yet. You've got the storyboard, or you've got the script, the radio script. You've got the press ad. Mm -hmm. You send it first. Wow. It's approved. Once you've got the stamp, then you go into production. So society was very orderly, if I may. But social media has disrupted that world Completely. Yeah. So that's what you had to do. If you were dealing with anything in the pharmaceutical world, Gillette stuff, toothpaste. Mm -hmm. um, you had to take it to the poisons board 
I mean, they're still there. Kenya poisons. Yeah, that's that. still that still yeah. happens. All so that stuff still, still happens. It's just the the content bit yeah. that now has you just had to, had to be checked. And that guy did. There was no bribing about nothing because if if they approved it and then you ran it and then it offended society, it was taken you know, down. And then also the cost right. came back to the regulators right. who approved it and stuff like that. I so, remember a show called To Shauriane. Do you remember To Shauriane? Yeah, <laughs> To Shauriane. <laughs> it was about HIV yes, and whatever, yes, and yes, they yes. showed a couple hugging. I remember being scandalized. I think I was like ten oh. or something, and you were dying. And like, then, oh my god, it was just taken off we so couldn't wa we was. couldn't watch it with yeah. our parents when i like, had to move slowly you know slowly and the church was very influential and they right. would, they would police a lot of what mm -hmm. the media was showing and right. stuff like that um all this totally disrupted by social media by so social it's not media. kenya that changed and became what it is today it's just the world changed with the mm. intro of social media and, and we, we had, had to, to catch, catch up. up yeah pretty much yeah. so how do you go from that to being an expat so i am at McCann's and uh -huh. um i we're launching Life Boy Soap or relaunching. It's always the same thing, being relaunched. I, I could, I could swear ingredient. it was relaunched two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure this one brand has, and many brands are just, right. you know, tweak here, tweak there, add mm -hmm. this, add that. Um, so there was this launch going on at Serena Hotel mm -hmm. and in the city. And I was um, the, you know, I was the junior. So I was the one who was there early, I set up the room, make sure everything is fine and da 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 da, -da as you do. And I've been there all day. And there was steps, uh, a staircase, a short one, but they had a cone on it. And on that cone, there was the sign saying, caution, loose step. Aha. Uh -huh. And I was very good. All day I paid attention, da 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 da. Mom was picking me up, hadn't bought the car yet. Mom was picking me up at eight. <laughs> I remember. And she said, you know, make sure you're here at eight. Otherwise, you're going to have to figure out how to take a taxi to take you back to Laurentia. And Laurentia mm. those days, because was Westland was kind of dead, it was like through it was a another forest. County. And it was another county, you needed a passport. Right. Yeah, you needed a passport. It was like you had <laughs> left Kenya. It was so far away. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm in industrial area, but now we're in Serena, Nairobi. It was very far away. So mom was going to pick me up. And I was conscious of that. And I told my boss, I have to leave at eight. The launch started at six. So it was just those nices that you do after hours. Mm hmm and then it was 10 past eight. And then I ran and um, I tripped and I fell. And I fell and I broke my ankle. Didn't know that for a while. But anyway, I fell and I remember being on the ground and, and, and I used to like wearing short, short dresses. I still do. You have great legs. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> Dad always told me that I had nice you legs. You have great so legs. I was just, uh -huh. I've always honored it. Yeah. So I fell and I could feel myself falling and I thought, I bet I look like a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> all limbs <laughs> so I got to the bottom and there were some feet male shoes uh, just sheer disbelief horror that you've fallen down and a man has seen you I was praying as I stood at the up. feet of I a man he is a hundred years old he was not he's a nice guy uh -huh. he helped me and you know sorted my bag flew out and all that very embarrassing stuff so I hopped uh, him helping me to my mom's car and then I left. But the pain was terrible in the middle of the night, you know, screaming, had to be taken to Nairobi Hospital, surgery. Um, yeah, the ankle was broken. Oh dear. That man would then become my husband many years on. So that's how we met. How did he find you? Um, <laughs> because he was coming for the launch. Okay. So then he called the company and said, oh, what happened to um, the lady who fell down? You know, I want to get in touch with her, da, da, da. And Make so, sure she's okay. Yeah. I love it. When a man wants to find a woman. He'll find you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No I, hope, I hope the young girls are listening. Yeah. This thing well, about texting, to find Sasa, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know. I don't even know. You know, for the younger generation, really, you, the guys, you just got to just be the guy. Be mm -hmm. the guy. Don't let women overrun the game. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. Because in my time, uh -huh. what that time is, or maybe it's just my style, perhaps, as an individual, uh, I will not hunt the man. I don't even mm -hmm. know what that looks like. I, I love that How he saw you I, not at your best, falling yeah, downstairs, falling down, limping. Limping, <laughs> gathered myself, said, thank you, I'll be fine, I'll walk to the car. He says, no, 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 I'll help you. So he helps me to the car. Says hello to my mother. So that's how he met my mom. Okay. And um, yeah, so now I'm, I've had the operation, I'm back home. Can't go to work, can't drive, can't do nothing. And the receptionist rings me and says, you know, so-and-so is uh, looking for you. Uh -huh. I'm like, no, 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 don't have time, though. Not interested. And two weeks into being at home 24-7 with nothing to do, your brain is working. It's just you're right. in a cast. Yeah, when she called again and said, you know, 
So it's so really just wants to say hello and check on you. I said, yeah, let him come. Yeah, so yeah, he yeah. kept calling for the two weeks. I like it. It would appear. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, um, I said, yeah, you know, yeah, fine, he can come. And then we spoke on the phone and I said, you know, make sure you come between this time and this time. My dad comes home at this time. I would really appreciate it if you came before my dad came. <laughs> da, 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 da. Firstborn girl, never brought a guy to, to, to dad. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling some sort of way, as girls feel with their dads. Um, so, yeah. And he came late. And then when he was leaving, <laughs> there was no Google Maps. Okay. So the way I described it, he said that, you know, I'm a good driver. I know the city, but I don't know where this place is. I got lost. Oh, God. Our, was, our descriptions those days. Yeah. Uh, by the at third the kiosk, bump. At the kiosk, you see a, 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 you know, a poster. And then, you know. <laughs> Co work. Count three bumps. Count three turn bumps, left. Look for the left. tree with yellow flowers. <laughs> but if the tree with yellow flowers is not in bloom, you'll just have to work it out. Right. You know, yes. Okay. So. Um, he did come. Um, he came in about 40 minutes late. And then, you know, we just had tea and coffee in the veranda. No, there was no coffee. We had juice and water in the veranda. And then I said, well, now you've got to go because my dad's coming back with my younger siblings. He's bringing them back from school. And as soon as he got up and went to his car, then dad came. <gasps> so he couldn't get out. So dad had to, you know, they had to meet. And I was so shy. I'm so scared. And just like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. Anyway, my dad was absolutely fabulous. So day one, he meets mom. Day one, he meets dad and siblings. And sibling, the two. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So he's going nowhere. Basically, well, like, at this know, point, I, I, like, I was just like, well, this is awkward. Uh -huh. Anyway, hi dad. Does it, oh, no, no, young man, you can have you had a cup of tea. And blah, 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 blah. Yes, sir, I'm just leaving. And an extremely polite gentleman. Uh, hubby still is and um, yeah and dad is the same very upright very no nonsense and I think his coup d'etat for my husband is mm -hmm. that he spoke Luo and I think oh. dad was like oh my daughter can actually bring me somebody that you know we, we can round him <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can I know where his relatives I, yes, are from I can find these people <laughs> So that's how we, we did it. And, um, and, and so he'd come once in a while. Eventually, I got tired and I started going back to work. And um, yeah, but also the boy isn't quite telling you that you're the girlfriend or you're not quite saying you're the boyfriend. You're just, shall we hang out? Would you like to go for a concert? Would you like to go to the theater? Would you like, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Come Srore. <laughs> I think. People oh, rush it. People. So, um, yeah, so I didn't have time to remember that he was a boyfriend or him. I don't know okay. when he was the girlfriend. But we really did get on and it was great. And eventually I moved out of home. Mm -hmm. He moved on to London. He was sent out as an expat. Mm -hmm. And so he came to ask me to marry him. I remember doing, what? I don't know if I can get married now. And then I How looked at my you? age and I remember thinking, not saying. I remember thinking, <laughs> oh, I think I can get married. Oh, I think you should get married. And yeah, so I went back. Because honestly, um, career was everything. Oh. I think that's all I saw at home. So career was absolutely what drives me and really what drives um, all my siblings. And because that's what you see, mm -hmm. you know, um, making your own money, uh, learning and climbing up life's corporate chain. Um, yeah, so I'm quite factored in this marrying thing. Many of my friends had, not many, a few of my friends had started, but I think it wasn't, it wasn't top of mind. Really, really, Did really, you feel really. like it'll just settle in? I never thought about it. Like marriage. it'll just turn up? I never thought about it. It was my career. It's making good money, it's traveling the world. Just never, it, I don't know. It wasn't. Did you want kids? Like no. was, it so wasn't in my DNA. I don't know what was happening. I was earning good money traveling, doing amazing work, had now moved into my own apartment. Uh -huh. I, I think sometimes, not everybody, some women and some men plan that they wish to get married. Mm -hmm. It's quite strategic and they work towards that and they purpose it and will it into their lives. Yes, they're prayer, very intentional. Very intentional. And, yes. um, and some people you're still doing life when it shows up. And right there, as a human being, you're always in choice. So uh -huh. right there is where you then decide, oh, all right then. I, I guess yeah. I could do this. I could do you're this. You're a good I guy. Could. And then I said, so how does this work? Because you're in England and I'm here. And yeah, and I can't come to England to be a housewife. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But the British Kenyan uh, have a reciprocal relationship where a Kenyan spouse to the expat is also given a work permit. Okay. And that's the same for the English coming into Kenya. Not mm -hmm. all countries have it. No, a lot, lot of them don't actually. A lot of them don't. Yes. A lot of them, it means that the families have to be separated, the husband and the, mm. the wife, or the wife can become a house. Wife, or these days it's flipping, 
uh, sometimes it's the lady who's the corporate expat and, and hubby is following. House the, the phrase is called trailing spouse. Trailing spouse. I, it used to peeve me no end. But that's the phrase. Trailing. Yeah, the one who follows the uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> like some strap somewhere. Like, like some dog. <laughs> <laughs> trailing. That does not sound good at all. Okay. So we get married. Uh -huh. um, on a Sunday afternoon. I am in England on Monday. Uh -huh. And therein begins the whole expatriate journey. And uh, so my first, he was in London, uh, High Street Ken. And that is very, very a fantastic space to mm -hmm. be in. And I did about two months. But I had traveled. As kids, we had traveled with our parents abroad. I, my first trip, I was 10. So traveling, going to different countries. Was, it wasn't brand new. It wasn't it, brand new. Okay. It, brand new was the fact that I was going to live with somebody. Mm. Um, and brand new is I was going to live there for uh, four years. Mm -hmm. That was the, the contract. So yeah, so we began the expat journey. I did two months um, traveling, seeing loneliness, fear. It was winter. It was uh, December. Um, missing my friends now. I'd had the beautiful wedding and I don't have time to recap with them yeah. on my own. And that was very lonely. So I would say that the first UK assignment was the loneliest one. Mm -hmm. um, but I was single. I mean, single as in I didn't have kids. So after two months, I applied to Gillette. Again, because the head office was in London. Was okay. In You're like, we know Actually, each other. Yeah. Hey. So I wrote and I said, this is my story. Da, da, uh -huh. da, da. Now, the MD who had been in Kenya had been reposted mm -hmm. many years on back to the UK. So he was working in the UK office. I got in touch with him. Be good to people. Thank you. We always can use them mm -hmm. later in time. Nice. Um, so I rang Mr. Edwards. Well, I found him. He was still there. And I don't know. Anyway, I got a job. So I started working for Gillette London. Mm -hmm. and that began my corporate journey. And then did the same thing. Did mm -hmm. a year at Gillette and then swapped and went to McCann Ericsson London, where I would then work. And now it was about scale. That was the difference. It was about scale. It was also the first time that I got to see that educational systems really do shape people differently. The Kenyan educational system was very much, and in, and in some ways still is, very much about cramming. Mm -hmm. cramming to regurgitate an exam paper to get the A. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in Kenya, we really do... I mean, whole newspaper ads have children's photographs who have got A's and A minuses and whatever. I have a thing about that. That Then you glorify education and and it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't... I think it's... Anyway, each country does what they want to do and this is our, our thing in Kenya. So, but that's a good point. Like, so what, what, because education is no longer the only way to make it in life. It's not, it isn't. And a lot of people have not gone into unis and stuff and are entrepreneurs, are businessmen and women, um, you know, ecosystems oh, change, times right, change. Right. And so we should adapt to that because if you, if a whole school puts out a full page ad of the top 20, 15 students that have got A's, mm -hmm. what are you saying about those who've gone into Tivets, right. vocational colleges, should they also put an ad to say, here are our top 10? And actually, yeah. as we all pursue media and production yes. and Where are you being guys? in front of the camera yes. and all this stuff, we need electricians, we need plumbers, yeah. we need someone to lay the brick as we're building the city yeah. and that all really that. Is, so, yeah. So I think that um, that should change. I, uh, that's my personal view. I think okay. the... The linear way through education, where you go from nursery, primary, high school, and university, yes, we do that, and all countries do that, but it should not be glorified at the expense of mm -hmm. those who might stop at uh, fourth form and now go into um, mm -hmm. these other spaces, which are huge. And I'll talk about that about when I moved to uh, Holland and what I found there and mm -hmm. how they manage that. You can talk about it now, because okay. I, I, so I was going to ask you, so how, where have you lived? Yeah. And all so, this, yes. Oh, yeah, okay. So I lived in England at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember one of those uh, seismic moments in my life was when Princess Diana died. And it was just like, oh my God. Uh, and, and life stopped totally, because I lived on the same street. Actually, okay. not far. And... and um, we were in the same I, I, neighborhood in England. Were you there? I was doing my A levels and I lived between Queensway Station and Paddington Station. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> yes. What? You're doing your A levels? I didn't. And, and I, commuting home? Or I was, no, I was, I was doing them in central London. So I was living in a student hostel. And oh then I was at Abbey Tutorial College. I used oh to walk to school, but that was my neighborhood. On your own? A 17, 18 year old <laughs> yes, kid? Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Neighborhood. Our neighborhood, yes. High Street Ken, Queensway, mm -hmm. yes, all in the same. And London did come to a complete standstill. Yeah, totally. 
Totally, 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 totally stopped. Okay. Absolutely stopped. But it didn't do much for me. We like, didn't go home. I okay. remember we did not go home for 12 days because you couldn't get home. The tube mm -hmm. was closed and and because um, the scores of people right. that were out there. So we stayed in a hotel. Couldn't get home to get your clothes or anything. Had to buy clothes and everything and keep going to work. And um, when everything settled, um, the Royal Borough of Kensington, which, mm -hmm. you know, each locality has a has a... You know, like you're either in Westlands and there's a, a borough of Westlands mm -hmm. or whatever. Yes. Um, would then ask all of us who never could get home during that period to send in our bills, receipts, mm -hmm. everything. For your inconveniences. Because we had to buy food and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did they not know us. that. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, they paid us good money and it was very, it was very, it was very nice. Because mm -hmm. really, you could not get home right. for 12 days at the time when the world has really mm -hmm. come to a standstill. So I was working at my cans. Um, I would do my can. I would then stop going to my master's. I did an MBA, marketing management. Um, because again, mm -hmm. this is what you do. And you want to climb. It had become very obvious that if I, in, in my world, the marketing branding world, that a second degree is preferred. It helped. You could see the ads. You still see them now mm. where people say an advanced degree will be an advantage. Or right. Be, yeah. I did my master's. That was brilliant. I loved it. It was just brilliant to be back in school with people from all over the world. Uh, I did it at Kingston Business School in London and then did not go back to McCann's. I went to Leah Burnett. Okay. And so I worked in Leah Burnett, London, and a lot of my time was spent in Chicago, their, their main office. In this journey... Um, so how is in London? You're in Chicago? No, you're, you're doing... also in this space where many people who move to London to work, that's HQ for a lot of the companies that they're working for. Right. And HQ means you are on a plane all the time. Going oh. to look at the operations in different in your region, whatever region you have been allocated. I do remember I was for my job. I was allocated EMEA, mm -hmm. Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Okay, so that was my route. Hubby, at the time when I was now at doing EMEA, was looking after LACA, Latin America and Central Asia. We never met. You're in different parts. Yes, yeah, totally different parts of the world. So it was all about... Um, Making appointments. I'll, I'll, be, make I'll be home on Wednesday. No, no, <laughs> I'll be in Paris. Can you transit through Paris and then we'll meet? Oh. Like that. It was literally p targeting different cities and also wanted to travel and see it. Okay. But different cities in order to meet or, you know, Latin America and Central Asia. So that's These that. sound like such good I'm problems. In Europe. Yeah, but they're Babe, good problems. Let's meet in Frankfurt. That's let's what it do was. what it that's what it was. Like you're in uh, hotels. Which airport and... are you at? Oh, I'm landing at, <laughs> let's say, I'm landing at Moy Airport in uh, Mombasa. Oh, damn, I'll be at Jomo Kenyatta. Yeah, uh -huh. we're in the same country, <laughs> but you can't see each other. So we would right. tie in our flights and, you know, sometimes stay in the hotels at airports. So oh, whoever so could that catch you, their connecting okay. flight on. It really was. And then that's what the experts were doing. Mm -hmm. If the spouse was also working, it was because most of the time you're in the air, literally you're in the air. So in a month, 20 working days, um, the rule at McCann's, uh, equally at Leah Burnett, was you had to be in the skies. That's what we used to call it. Uh, you haven't been in the skies forever. That's what your boss would be complaining. <laughs> and I'm from Kenya thinking, oh, you do want me to really travel? Oh, okay, I'll travel. I'll take it. No problem. <laughs> you had to be in the skies 12 out of 20 days. So you were gone a lot. And um, so I traveled the world and that I saw hectic. the world. And it's hectic and it's amazing and it's fantastic. Remember, I had started it with dad and mom. So mm. it was just... Wow, a continuation. I get to do it. You're traveling business class because there's a lot of travel, so you can't be in economy. There's a lot of business class. You get spoiled that way. And then, of course, there's holidays where you want to travel. My father was a professor of geography. Mom was a CEO of in the tourism sector. So, again, their roles that, were that also was, traveling. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, traveled away. And then I would come to Kenya once a year on, on leave, mm -hmm. which the companies would pay for. Company also paid for my master's program. Not my company, his company. Okay. Why? Um, Many corporations had found and find that if you don't look after the second spouse, who by now are more corporate, have mm. degrees, mm. had a career, they've just come and joined their partner, you would lose that person. Like you would lose my hubby right. if I wasn't happy. Well, because you, if your partner is not happy... It doesn't work. So a lot of expatriation is trial and error. Okay. Uh, you have a really relaxed mindset. I think I went when I was young. And um, we had no kids. Mm. So you could do and be what you want to be. Um, but many had to go back. The mom's not settling well or the kids are not happy at their new schools. Mm. So many expats tend to go home. So Unilever had this program where they would empower the spouse. Okay. And so um, they would pay for you to do either their master's. And if you had a master's, they'd be paying for your PhD for the period that your spouse is at work. 
So I took advantage of that and I did my master's. It was, I say, just super, super, super A time. free degree, I love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know, you know. But also I was a UN, a free degree. You only, I'll tell you when I started paying for back the Kenyan <laughs> government for the free education they gave me at the University of Nairobi. Uh -huh. So anyway, um, eventually, now Habi is being uh, posted. He's changed jobs. An ad is in the Financial Times. He applies for the job. The job is to set up Celtel, oh. which at the time was called Mobile Systems International. And um, he applied for the job. The job was based out of Amsterdam. So whoop, off we go and we move again. Now, I've been coming to Kenya once a year and my African people mm -hmm. are having some feelings about, well, you've been married a minute and there's no child. And then, yeah. And you're like, but masters, but yeah. travel, but, 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 but. And they're like, baby. <laughs> baby child, your skin be black. Uh -huh. um, yeah, a lot of pressure. Yes, yes. And I think, it, again, I think I'm just slow to this whole <laughs> marriage and let's have kids thing. Korea, Korea, uh -huh. Korea. You're hearing me and the whole career space. So I felt bad. I felt sad. One day I overheard a conversation. And I was very sad, the in-laws. And I was like, oh, they think I can't have a baby. And, and the oh, man got me sorted. Oh, so they started asking, the, is something They're wrong? They're asking their son. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. Can we help? It's been a minute. Mm -hmm. No, no. What do you mean? Can oh. I help? Can we get you someone else? It's yeah. really how Africa does it. There's no help. Just, Africa is Africa. Yeah, I thought you were in we the are people. I thought I you were in the corporate family, space. So I thought someone is saying IVF. I didn't no, think you could get you no, someone no, no. else. I think at the end of the day, you might pursue your corporate uh -huh. international life mm -hmm. or your Nairobi life and your bougie and uh, whatever. whatever. Uh -huh. But at the end of the day, you go back to your roots. Your roots are your DNA. Right. And they, they, they shape you. They shape they each of us. How I am as a... An African Kenyan Luo is different from an African Namibian That's true. solar, you know, but it is still the grain that mm -hmm. makes me different from a white person, an Asian, whatever. It's true. When I want to know how I really feel about something, yeah. I speak to myself in Kikuyu. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm at home. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, you touch come, base. You come back. You center to yourself. Like, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And anyway, thank goodness for that because in this world where now, um, the world is all one thing on right. social media. You can see what the guy in Buenos Aires does or the mm -hmm. girl my age in Japan. Um, having your own identity as a people mm -hmm. is core because people are now traveling in tourism, for example, not to see the fancy, beautiful, distant princesses necessarily. Mm -hmm. They want to immerse themselves. It's called immersion tourism where they want to see I'd like to live with a Kenyan family, uh, maybe learn how to make ugali and mm -hmm. how do they eat, breathe. It's called as experiential tourism, tourism or immersion tourism, where you are now living and learning a people for a period of a two-week vacation. Mm -hmm. um, I did that in Italy my first time, and, and by then I had the kids, and we were in Napoli, Naples. Uh -huh. And, you know, online you register for activities you want to do. You don't need a travel agent, clearly, anymore. And I signed up to, I want to know how to make pizza. So we went to a family in ah. Naples. It was beautiful. Oh, my son would love home, that. Uh -huh. you know? And um, learned how to make pizza. But while they're doing that, you know, the wine is there. Right. You're in their home, in their kitchen. The music, the music and music. all that. They yes. Just, so um, a lot of, and Kenya will move there. I was, one of the things I was doing when I was in tourism, and I'll talk about that when we get there, uh, <laughs> was how do we get people foreigners to get immersed into our different cultures. Or even ourselves. I'd love yes. to know. Like, I'd like to know how the Kikuyu do what? You know, I'd, I mean, I'd love how to, do they marry? Good I want to learn and... how to cook fish properly. Oh, yeah. I'm allergic to fish. <laughs> what? So that would be a whole thing. Are you sure you're allergic? The dowry was not paid in full because, well, our son's going to suffer because she doesn't do fish. <laughs> Are you sure you're allergic? <laughs> I know. It was... I'm, I'm, I'm sure there, someone else asked the question. When I lived and worked there, it uh -huh. was a whole thing. But back to the journey of how you go from being a, this young mm -hmm. kid to being this young adult to right. becoming in the expatriate world. And, and then that has been my life. And um, so we moved to Holland. And There's I, something you're going to say about the Holland, about the education system there. Oh, yeah. Right. So the kids go to the British school mm -hmm. um, in Den Haag. Den okay. Haag is the Dutch words for The Hague. So okay. I lived in The Hague. Uh, Hubby would commute to Amsterdam. It was not hard to drive. Mm -hmm. So in Holland, what I learned from my neighbors and other, you know, you're living there. I was there for a long time. Um, only the people who got A's, A, A minus, A plus, I don't know, they went to university and nobody else. Oh. Everybody else went into tertiary uh, 
these like in Kenya we call them TIVETs. TIVETs, Pol the, formerly polytechnics. Yes. And now, okay. To get the skills that the society and the economy needed, ranging from and not limited to how to be uh, in construction, the oh. painter, the plumber, the electrician. I'm seeing the, the skills same. I was just talking about, right? Absolutely. The electrician Absolutely. and all that, which are vital skills. Completely. I'm watching, I'm in Egypt now and I'm watching how they do it. It is on steroids because the whole population cannot all be graduates and there's no need for it mm. uh, to be senior managers of organizations. There mm. are only so many organizations and only so many managers. And a lot of these corporates are international, so they bring their own anyway. Okay. So a society cannot function when most of the population doesn't have just the skills. Hairdressing, um, mm. plumbing, nail technicians, in the nursing, uh, in the medical space, how to be a radiologist and whatever they do there. Mm -hmm. um, everything True. that is not management, but you will get that skill. And in time, you will be a manager if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Or you'll be the entrepreneur and set up your own business. So that was what I saw in Holland. So B mm -hmm. downwards, mm -hmm. everybody went to school to learn a skill. A specific skill. I want to do pottery. Mm -hmm. I want to learn art. I want to know metalwork. I want I to want make to shoes. Someone shoes. has to make yes. the shoes. <laughs> and and the, uh -huh. the society just, it was a sponge. The society, the economy would just take them year in, year out. And so you find in those economies, um, it's a robust economy because mm -hmm. they can then create industries. So what are we doing wrong? Is it that we don't pay enough for those people? Because then what happens is you don't want to be a plumber. You don't want to be an electrician because you're looking yeah. at the potential pay. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, we've set up TIVETs, mm. but we're glorifying University the degrees. degrees. Yeah. I think that's the shift. If we can just, yeah, people who are doing degrees mm. are doing degrees. And then but, when people with degrees do different work, yeah. if you have a degree and then somehow you go into plumbing or yes. electrician or no you're stigma. making shoes or whatever, we look at it as a failure. And, it, and we it, call and it unemployment. Yeah. And it's so sad because you just need to leave your geography, the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of Kenya, and enter another jurisdiction. And you're like, oh, that's how uh -huh. you do it. So they glorify, not glorify, they elevate, it's not glorification. Okay. They elevate um, these other skills. Okay. They really do. I am, you know, where we are in Egypt is, um, wow, it's... Uh, you don't have Chinese contractors bringing the Chinese to come and build the roads. Mm -hmm. You just have the Egyptians doing everything. They build roads. They build, they build everything. They don't bring in foreigners to do it. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no such chance. It does, I mean, it's just amazing. So then you absorb, to see that. you absorb your population. Right. They're busy. Men are occupied all day. It's true. Women are occupied all day. Because we had young people looking at these highways being built and there was no room for them. And there were only so many highways also. Yes. You know? So each economy, mm. each leader um, creates mm -hmm. an ecosystem that is either absorbing its population into okay. gainful employment or not utilizing their population. And then come the social vices because I'm unemployed, I'm a man, I've, me and my boys have nothing to do all day, every day. And, you know, we've got graduates who can't get jobs. Let right. Alone, yeah. Yes. So um, the current administration is trying to work a plan. Let's see. Okay. But I think the population is reticent. They've been hearing those promises so much. And I think the population is like, we're, where are the we're industries? cynical. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I see know. the commentary every time, like on Instagram, you yeah. know, the president makes an announcement or somebody in his government. And I see, I read the comments. I'm always in the comments. In the, I think it's... until you create industry mm. where you can say, Nairobi, in the last year, seven industries have come up. Mm. And people can see that. And then we start to hear those stories. I got employed at. And I think it's happening, but it's so little. Mm. And they're not celebrated. It's not out here overtly. Mm -hmm. You keep hearing about how in the economy of today, companies are closing and moving away mm. because of the business taxes or whatever. But there's also a flip side. There must be people who are setting up industries, but we're not hearing those. So, okay, you've lived many places. So I've lived many places and enjoyed them all. Bahrain, uh -huh. uh, Egypt, back to England... Kenya, came to Kenya for five years to... How to was that? To... How was Kisumu? Because you didn't just come back home to Nairobi that you know well. You went, you went I motherland. from <laughs> London into uh -huh. Kenya, bypassed Nairobi and went to Kisumu for five years. Wow. And then into, from corporate multinationals into local government. And that That sounds is, like culture shock. Yeah. On, like, but, but there's so me, many different levels. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, culture shock, sure, for different levels. But because I am used to living in different places... Mm -hmm. I find it very natural to just plug and play. I just, for me, life in a suitcase is fine. And you just go and find out what the world has to offer. So okay. that part didn't intimidate me at all. In fact, I was amazed. Why aren't Kenyans in the counties? I would find out why. 
five years on. But why aren't we in the counties? I think structures are still not there. They're not tight. Um, people still look down at them. Those are county guys. It's nothing like a county guy. It's government. Mm -hmm. um, I also got a full appreciation of how government is so amazing mm -hmm. and is so powerful. A signature of me, a Waziri in tourism and what that could open up for the youth or for my county or my city, Kisumu city, was so big. It's so mm -hmm. impactful. But I think also just as a country, our, our values are being challenged in this space of corruption and lack of accountability to the population and all of that. And that makes doing good not get seen. Right. Kenyans are good people. It, good also sounds, it also sounds defensive. Yeah. Because yeah. anytime, I, I actually really appreciate yeah. our government. And the, and the more you travel in Africa mm -hmm. and you recognize just how far ahead Kenya is of yes. like other, you know, our neighbors. Yeah. And when I say that, it always sounds like I'm defending mm -hmm. something. And I'm like, actually, no, I'm just telling you how things, yeah. <laughs> like our systems, some of our systems really do work. Yeah. I think, I think and, it, and, and you know, the government has talked about it. Um, the current administration is talking about it. Uh, I remember listening to this phrase where mm -hmm. one of the leaders was saying, corruption is at an industrial scale. And, I, and I, those two words, industrial scale, just, it was really like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's real. So... That notwithstanding, mm -hmm. you are in a task, you have a role, and you must do your magic right. within, within that space. So Kisumu was, oh, it was different. It was very hot. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, it was it's a very, very hot town. And uh -huh. I have been living in cold places forever. <laughs> so I remember struggling with that. Uh -huh. um, they assumed I was Lua and could speak Lua. Or why would they not? And I didn't. You don't speak Lua? I did not. All these years. Now you can say nothing about me. But then I was <laughs> zero. I was just like... You know, just hello and bye-bye and uh -huh. city life. I didn't speak Lua. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't spoken at home. And yeah, that was the challenge. But I remember in my interview, you get interviewed by the panel from the uh, assembly. Right. And you also have members of the public in the room. We had 300 members of the public in the room. Oh, nice. And then you have to walk along, like you're getting married, down an aisle. You get to the front. And then the panel is there, the speaker of the assembly and his... Um, the committee that is handling uh, recruitment. Okay. 15 people. And, you know, it's my first sojourn into government. I'm thinking, oh, well, this looks a bit organized and whatever, whatever. But as you walk passing 300 people on your way, you can mm -hmm. hear the comments from members of the public. And I was thinking, oh, thank God I checked the back of my outfit and I know what I look like because <laughs> you're pretty intimidated by wow. the public. What were the, some of the comments? Do you um, remember? No, you know, just guys being guys and you okay. know, just that sort of stuff. But You're getting hair cold as you're about you, to yeah. be. Yeah, and, and intimidated and booed or whatever it might be. Remember, this is the public. You are applying oh. for a public role. They're entitled to do and say whatever they want to say. Public participation is this. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, checking on you and listening to you. So 10 ministers uh, in Kisumu County. And uh, so when I went for my interview, it was very robust. It was a one and a half hour interview. Let me tell you, I studied for that job. I didn't become a minister by chance. I studied. I understood my sector. Tourism, culture, sports, communication was easy. I, I like that I, you're I, confirming. No cronyism, like no, you have to no, qualify. No, no, you, no, okay. no. I was very clear, just like in the corporate private sector world, that I'm not showing up for any interview some sort of way. Mm. I was completely on top of my, I was ready for that interview. Nice. And I studied. When I say studied, I mean heads down, reading the constitution, the what has Kenya been doing while I was away for 300 years? Mm -hmm. um, what's the devolution about? What do I want to shape for mm -hmm. Kisumu in terms of tourism and culture and sports? Um, can I take on also a national job, which I would then do as well? But I, 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 so I have very low regard for anybody showing up for an interview to me or to anybody mm. sort of prepared. I have no, but I came from a professor and a CEO, so it was never going to happen. Okay. I studied. I remember, I remember uh, my husband was here for a trip at that time and he was staying at Sankara. And I remember there's a lounge room in Sankara and I was there from morning to lunchtime, five days a week. And then I was ready. What is culture? What is it about? What's the national government doing in culture? What has Kenya been doing in culture? Tourism, who are we doing? Who are the ministers? What has, what's their vision? What is the uh, national blueprint, uh, mm -hmm. vision 2030? Yes. What is it? So no, show up fully uh, ready for that game. Anyway, when it came to this question about, well, you don't even look like you speak Luo. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I said, well, no, I don't. No, or I think I was asked by the speaker. So do you speak the language in the community in which you're coming to work? And I said, well, kind of, not really, actually, no. But yeah, I'll learn. I learned Dutch when I was in uh, Holland. And he was very strict and said, no, well, that was Holland and you're in Kenya and you need to know your language and how are you going to do this job if you don't know how to communicate with the public? This is a mm -hmm. public job. And, and then I said, what's the difference between Luo and English? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. There is a reason why we're called Luopians. Now that got the 300 people behind me stomping <laughs> on their feet. <laughs> and that is how I slid into that job. Okay. And then, of course, it is at the discretion of the governor. Uh, he gets a short list of three as with all positions in Kenya, mm. national and county, and then the leader or the the committee or the board then choose who they want. Well, that makes sense. He yeah. has to. He has to. You're his team. Yep. So we are he, the ones who deliver the right, mandate right. of his manifesto or her right. manifesto. So you've got to see: is there rapport? Is there good chemistry? Da, da, da. And so, will yeah. you match with the rest of the team? Will there, yeah. will there be cohesion? And, and 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 there wasn't cohesion per se because in government again, different from private sector, everybody comes from everywhere. Mm -hmm. People who have never left the country are there. People who have never left that county are there. People who, yeah, it's government. It is an all-inclusive system where all of the, the, it should reflect the face of the country. Mm -hmm. So some people have never left the county. Some people have never left the country. Some people have, to be an, uh, a minister, you have to be a degree holder. Some people have a PhD. Some people have a bachelor's. And okay. so where, which was different from the private sectors where I had been, where if it was a blue chip company, the multinationals, they tended to take the top accountant, the top marketing right. person. So you're kind of talking to, your, mm -hmm. to the people you get you okay. know, and get you. You either went to the top There's schools. There's less explaining. Yeah, you went to the right schools. You went in and, in and, in and you kind of, yeah. So this was different. That really was quite different. What was your vision mm -hmm. coming into the position? What did you want to yeah. achieve? Having been an expat and having been traveling since I was a 10-year-old kid abroad and across the country because mom was in tourism. So we saw a lot of Kenya. Um, my itch was, why is Kenya no longer the country of choice for international tourists. Mm -hmm. When I first left Kenya to go abroad, Kenya was it. We yeah. were the whole it nine was, It yards. was the bucket list item. Yeah. I remember meeting people like in the UK and they're like, you're from, you're from Kenya. Kenya. My parents have been saving. Yes. Like, this is their yes. plan to do which yes. anniversary, 20th, 25th, the Mara, whatever. The, this, right. the, that, the Mount Kenya. The, we had uh, from independence really created a very robust tourism mm -hmm. sector in mm -hmm. Kenya. And many nations had not. You know, different leaders prioritized different things at different right. times. Kenya had, from the get-go, tourism was their thing. They were drawing in international people and their dollars and their pounds. And mm. yeah, Over the time, as I spent many more years in uh, expatriate in, in different countries, it no longer was. Mm. All of a sudden, Botswana, if I'm talking about Africa, was a place, was the place. Tanzania. Namibia, Tanzania. Um, in Africa. And I don't mean it to slight any of the citizens of those countries. It's just a recognition that if you sit on your laurels, somebody else is going to be like, Slip. well, yeah, we're just going to take that slot. So these other countries were coming up, Mozambique, Malawi, and these are not really particularly robustly developed countries. Right. Their hotels don't look like ours, like even flights in and mm -hmm. out are not, you know, yes, I, I've completely... You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And um, so we were losing that slot. We were not marketing ourselves globally. We were, I, think, I guess we had become content. We were the number one African mm. destination of choice. Um, and so the numbers were stagnant in terms of the number of tourists that come into the country. So what was my vision for Kisumu? My whole vision for Kenya was, how can I assist the national minister and the country and Kisumu get people to come and travel into Kisumu. Um, so I remember a hundred days into the job and the governor asking, so he asked each of us, I suppose, or he certainly asked me, uh, what are you going to do in tourism? What are you going to do in culture? What are you going to do mm. in sports? And I saw them all as interconnected because when I travel, these things are interconnected. Mm -hmm. I'm a tourist who's gone to Italy. I was going to Cap Capri Islands mm -hmm. and I stopped in Naples to catch the connecting flights. Uh, remember I talked about the pizza. Right. And so that's culture. When I'm going into somebody's house as a tourist to learn how they make a food that is their culture. Mm -hmm. um, how, and then there was, uh, often I will always go for a sports fixture mm -hmm. in whichever city or country I'm in. Uh, in Egypt recently, I think it was December, I saw online that Kenyan basketball was coming to play Egypt. 
uh, it was called the FIBA Games, Federation of International Basketball Association or something okay. like that. And I remember I couldn't find it online and I went onto the page, the FIBA page or the Ministry of Sports and said, I can't find where this venue is and how to buy a ticket. Da, 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 da. They wrote back. Oh, nice. Ah, a gentleman called Charles Gasher, who I think I could see he was being tagged on a lot. So maybe he was the event planner or I okay. don't know. Yeah. The tickets are here. Find them at this. It's at Cairo International Stadium. Da, 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 da. And I went and it was electric and Kenyan women won that game. And, nice. Yeah. So I would also see that you can merge these three instead of mm -hmm. seeing them as silos. Oh, there are people who only go to Europe to watch football. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. But yes. they go there to watch the sport, mm -hmm. but they will partake in the, the food of that country. Right. They will go to the pubs, the clubs. The, mm -hmm. da, da, da. So it's called immersion. You just get to feel a, a, a city. I do that. So that's what I wanted to do for Kisumu. A hundred days in, don't have, I couldn't really see what would bring people in, in big numbers to really make a step change. Oh. But what I had identified, and I, that was a, a thing I was putting to the boss, was I would like to position Kisumu as a MICE destination. MICE meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibition. Mm -hmm. As a conference destination. So why would people come to Kisumu to, for conferences? And I said, well, I've done my feasibility study. Remember, I come from advertising where you do research and you mm -hmm. compare and you check. Talk to the national government. Always available for you if you want. If you're a Waziri from the counties and you want information, they are there. I don't think many utilize it, the resource. So I created the Department of Mice. Mm -hmm. So I had to create a department, hire people, get a budget, take it to cabinet, all these steps, take it to the assembly, try and convince MCAs why I need a budget for this department called Mice. What rat is this? I remember <laughs> one person asking me. Anywho, remember, <laughs> government is from everywhere. So yeah, yeah we created the okay. convincing thing. Why was it a, a possibility for me? Because we had the airport. Okay. Nairobi to Kisumu is a 26 minute flight. Is it really? 2 6. You have landed at 2 6 minutes. So it'll take you longer AQ. to get to the airport yes. than the <laughs> from <laughs> here, Westlands, where we are, right. to JKIA mm -hmm. is way longer <laughs> unless you use the expressway, which from here is 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. But it was that. It, I said, you know, we've got the airport, it takes 26 minutes. My job in tourism was also going to talk to airlines. I was a rather proactive. Waziri, in terms mm -hmm. of, because I learned that from private sector, you go out to look for what you want, not sit there as Waziri and wait for the world to come to you. They ain't coming. Uh, they don't trust government so much. You know, the private sector feels sometimes that we let them down. Government is intimidating. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. And I loved the fact that I was in government and intimidating. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. Quite an interesting experience. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So this is how it feels. Fantastic to work for. We'll government. talk about that in a yeah. second. Uh -huh. So we, I would go out and get the airlines, talk to them, Safari Link, Renegades, uh, Silverstone at the time, Freedom Air. I would travel, but then I had a boss who, and I had a budget. You can have a budget, but the boss might not let you. Every time you leave the county, you have to seek permission between Monday and Friday. Oh. It is in the law. You don't just swan off and you've gone to Narok County to see. Valid. So this idea we have of, you know, these ministers, they're just they uh, perambulating the country. Approval. It's not true. They've, okay. got, they've got approval. Um, I don't know what it is for the national government, but I think uh, the CSs can move around, mm -hmm. but maybe they're checking with the, the head of the public service. Okay. Um, that I, you know, let's say the head of state is in Nyanyuki and then we, I want to go. You have to kind of give some headway. You're using government fuel, a government driver. You're earning per diem. Mm. There's also protocol. You There's know, three CSs at yes, one event, yes, you yes. know, so, okay. Or you must have told the governor that you're coming and mm. all these protocols are there. So yes, you seek permission. Ministers leaving the country seek the head of state's permission. You don't just go, even mm. if you have the budget. And that's how it works all the way up. So I would um, have a boss who would let me get out a lot. But I was out every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Every Saturday and Sunday I was in, out of Kisumu anyway. But for work. And I would tag my trips to a Monday or a Friday. Okay. So that I get value for money if, okay. I'm, if I'm going. Or even if it was a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Sometimes, you know, because it's 26 minutes, I'd come, mm -hmm. have the meeting, chop, back. In the office. Okay. Sometimes I'd come for the morning. I remember the governor arriving into Kisumu, seeing me leaving. Where are you going? Oh, remember, governor, I'm going to do ABC. And he says, but we have cabinet at two. I said, I'll be there. It's an aircraft. 26 <laughs> minutes. Oh, well. The flights that come out of Wilson Airport, they take 40 minutes. Still. Okay. So it was building up that. And so I positioned Kisumu as a MICE destination. Which okay. meant then convincing people to come in conferences for government. I remember um, Engage. Yeah. I remember yes, I the governor's yes. conference. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. All the governors when in the, the country. All the governors come. Yes. 
We hosted uh, Madaraka Day along the way. We hosted Afri Cities. Now, you know, climbing and slowly building Kisumu is a step. So mm -hmm. one is talking to the corporates, mm -hmm. telling them, you know, corporates in Kisumu, where is your head office? Can we go and meet your CEOs and convince them to come? And also by then, Kenyans were tired of just traveling to Nairobi for a conference or Mombasa. They wanted to see another side. And I think the leadership was offered a, a calmer Kisumu. Mm -hmm. I think people felt more relaxed coming about it. I certainly was all over the place on social media, everywhere, just showing and showing and showing. Mm -hmm. And packaging. And people would come mm -hmm. and talk to the... You see, once the airline stopped coming... We should do a data sphere in Kisumu. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> do, 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 do. Because actually, because as you're saying, like, why, if we can go to Kigali for conferences, yeah. and if we can go to Kampala, like, yeah. why, what's wrong with Kisumu? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just choices. It's the same leg. It's, the, it's just choices. And most of the mm -hmm. time, what would I find that people's comments were, wow, they'd never seen Lake Victoria. Seen it in your geography and history books, but you'd never seen it. These are just Kenyan citizens. Um, I would host a lot of events. Under culture, I remember hosting a UNESCO event where every single ethnic group in Kenya, 43 at that time, mm -hmm had to come for this UNESCO convention, which I pitch. You go and you pitch, just mm -hmm. like I used to pitch in advertising. I would pitch work. I would pitch to companies the why you need to be in Kisumu. Mm. So I pitched to UNESCO, um, falling under my culture docket, that I can host all. So what were they doing? They were bringing traditional groups from these different ethnic communities to come and do a competition and mm -hmm. to win. And then these people, would, the winners would then go to Paris for the international one. And I, we hosted it in Kisumu. There are a few things that I did in Kisumu that really blew my mind. That event was a, a one-week event where I saw all the colors, the shapes, the sizes of Kenyans. And even your lining, you're like, wow. Oh, mm -hmm. It was stunning. Nice. It was absolutely beautiful. But more than that, it was watching Kenyans say, Hiya, I went to the lake yesterday. Wow. It's shockingly large. You know, we think of lakes. Okay, I thought of lakes as these two small things yeah. we see in Central Province. No. And then, but I still Those remember I was a teenager. <laughs> Ponds, darling. It's true. Lake Victoria <laughs> is the world's second largest freshwater lake in true. the world. The first one is Lake Superior in uh, America, between America and Canada. You know, okay. Those five lakes, there's one called Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. That's the world's largest freshwater lake. This is the world's second largest freshwater lake. Okay. Remember the source of the Nile. The Nile starts yes, there. And yes. I mean, it's gigantous, but it also... Is. It feels just, like an ocean. Yeah, the, yeah, especially on the Kampala side, yeah. it really properly yeah. feels... Yeah, it's expanse because you get to see the lake yes, a lot. Yes. In Kisumu, um, a built-up city, a lot of industries built themselves along the lake so you don't see the lake. Mm -hmm. And um, we were often talking in my five years there about how do we bring down these industries yeah. and allow it to be a promenade them to move yeah. up further in mm -hmm. and build promenades where people can rollerblade and have little restaurants and even have lake. boats because it's yes. Yeah. So there are spots where you go. So mm -hmm. we would of course remember tourism, culture, sports interlinked the way I did it, and so people would go on these boats. And I remember having um, again those are. I have five real highlights. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. Having uh, Elliot Kipchoge come. To, to promote for us, for me, a free cities. And he came. The quote I invented, and I love it, greatness is never loud. Mm -hmm. He was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. he, he really, just his essence and his whole manner pulls you in. Beautiful man, fantastic gentleman. Anyway, we had him for the whole day from eight in the morning till just after lunch, three o'clock. And part of me wanting him to promote Sumo for Afri cities this international conference, mm -hmm. was I wanted him to go on the lake mm -hmm. and show us the lake. So we go onto the lake, speed boats and blah, 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 you know, the bling bling version. And when we were out there, uh, he's wearing his track suit, the Kenyan one, and there are fishermen on the sea, on the, on the lake, and one fisherman boat kept coming closer and closer. And eventually they said, who's that? You know, it's telling me in Luo or telling us, who's that? We can see that guy. He's dressed like Kipchoge. We did not announce that he was coming because wow. he didn't want the crowds. He does not like crowds. So he had asked, please, please, please don't announce that I'm coming. Let's come. We do the filming, the footage. We get it out and mm -hmm. I'll be gone by then. And um, I said to him, to keep Choge, can I say that it's you? He says, yeah. He'd never been on the water. He was like, wow, this is amazing. He was so nice. I, I just love being on the water. I could see him just change. And then I said, yeah, it's him. And they said, no, no, no. Elliot keep Choge. And I was like. It's true. It's him. <laughs> and they're telling me, no, no, the guy who runs. I was like, it's him. Come closer. They come closer. They're dying. Oh, and wow. then he says, 
Can I oh. get into a canoe? I've never been on a canoe. Uh -huh. Can I fish? He's asking them. Can I fish? Can I? Land? And that's oh. the iconic shot that we used in all the press, in all the international media, of him throwing his fishing net into okay. Lake Victoria, and the sun was soft and visit Kisumu for the Afrocities conference. You know, da 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 at Lake. Victoria, blah blah blah, and like that. So you use your you use your background from your marketing, your advertising mm -hmm. background, your international experience. You learn how to use uh, influencers to do mm -hmm. good for you, stuff like that. So that was Kisumu. It was very good. Why was it difficult? Um, the difficulty was um, um, the lack of where, what I might want for Kisumu. Mm -hmm. We all are working to the boss's agenda, his manifesto. Um, but each individual comes from a different background and brings their, their stuff to the table. So sometimes you don't find that you're moving in the same direction. Equally, things change. Bosses change what their priorities are, mm. and things are along the way. The environment changes or whatever's happening around the world changes. And um, yeah, that was the hardest part about the job. And then you disappoint the public because you mm. had said and put in a budget and they had seen it, public participation, you were going to do X then something changes in the background. And you don't go back to say, oh, now I'm not doing this. We've moved that money to this other ministry because they need that. You don't. And that's when you irritate the public. And, and, and sometimes people move on what government says. Yeah. You Once see, you said you were going to do it. Right. The president so. makes an announcement. We are no longer, we're no longer going to import cooking oil yeah. in five years. So what do you do? You plant sunflower. Yeah. Because you're like, we will have no <laughs> choice. <laughs> they're, they're going to buy my to buy my, And then you buy it and maybe the government has changed And then mind. maybe they change their minds. Yeah. So government can be a very touchy space for the public rightfully because mm -hmm. we are paid by their taxes. Right. And we are public servants. And it's just trying to find that balance. So that was mm. the, those are the things that I found very... Um, we didn't sometimes honor what we said we would do mm -hmm. and having to go back to the public all the time to explain that would not often happen. Sometimes not even getting an explanation even within your own government because sometimes also the boss has his reasons why he's doing something and maybe he's not privy to tell you. Mm. Um, or maybe an opportunity comes up. Yeah. Like a great partnership, an opportunity. Right, and right. it's like, okay, we need to prioritize. Yeah. And but if you say it on the table, then we get it. If you don't mm -hmm. say it, then that can cause disquiet. So in and of itself, uh, working in government was a great pleasure and I would jump into it anytime again. Really? Um, national, yeah, preferably national. Anytime, anytime. It works. When it has to work, it works. And if all of us are scared of it, then we will continue to get what we keep getting because there's no infusion of new energy and new learnings okay. into a set system. You've got to uh, allow new air in. Like Archie comes, she's from international, she brings in this international flavor, she brings airlines, she speaks well when she's representing her country or her You really people. sold Kisumu well. Yeah, I really you did. You really, really I was sold. very passionate about the job. I don't actually know another Waziri yeah. of tourism, and even the Nairobi one. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't. No, I kind of, um, I brought private sector into government, mm -hmm. which gave me that advantage. And style. And style. <laughs> I, I have no time for yes. a leader looking some sort of way. I'm looking at you on TV for the next 30 seconds. Can you please be, you know, well Because we together? see women get into government and put on the navy blue box. Yes. I, I must say that I was <laughs> right. told that. When uh -huh. I joined, I remember my first two, three weeks into the government, I remember HR coming to, to tell me respectfully that I would have to dress some sort of way. And I respectfully told her that will absolutely never be happening. But based on what? That government dresses a certain way, that we carry ourselves mostly in suits, that we are, uh, there's a way we need to be, we cannot be too f stylish or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, things like the former president introducing Dress Down Friday was a thing I took like this, and I know I was the only county that did it. There was something he introduced and said on Fridays, we've got to, wear African fabric and celebrate mm, our Africanness. And, celebrate Kenyan, and he started yes, wearing those shirts yes. and things. So I introduced that in the government in Kisumu. And for one year, one financial year, every Friday, you had to wear African outfits, nice. which I was doing very easily. It's my uh -huh. first and only time. Never done it after five years. Never did it before. Um, How did your team get, feel? Because sometimes it. people feel put upon. But no. were the women happy? Like they're, And the men. Uh -huh. It was African day. You had to wear African fabric. Nice. Um, I think I had been... You know, you have to go and sell ideas. Mm. So I would first tell my cabinet colleagues. You have to test it there. And uh, the professor would, my boss, governor, would, he often wore his African shirts. It's right. a wonderful idea. And I said, anyway, the president said, <laughs> tends to help. 
<laughs> and so I put these memos out on uh -huh. each floor, each ministry, and says, following the directive from the head of state, da 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 da, Kisumu will implement da da da, Kisumu, the minister government. Right. And and then plug and play. Nice. Public servants are serious. Civil servants, they don't joke. President has said, plug and play. Okay. And they're just wearing their own clothes. But I gave them an incentive every Friday. The first two best dressed man, best dressed woman, and their runners up would get. Uh, dinner at a top hotel in Kisumu or an nice. airline ticket. So I'd go and do a collaboration with my sector, uh -huh. the airlines. The, yeah. Give me so something. of course there's an incentive. And those are few goods. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'd put them in the newspaper and on the oh, social media pages. Nice. People like to be validated and celebrated. So we did that. So again, you're bringing your private sector M learnings mindset. and mm -hmm. mindset and pace. into government and pace. <laughs> oh, I ran my people. It was tough on them. Uh -huh. Bless them. They were amazing. They really were. My team was mwah. Uh, but it took time to mold and them to get me and me to get them. But, and I was very fast. And I've come from Europe. It was really rough at the beginning. Um, but I will say this. The civil servant, the public servant, mm. permanent and pensionable, that guy who works for Gavas since he was young and is there, mm -hmm. those guys are stellar. In whatever sector they're in, mm -hmm. they are really experts in that area. Mm -hmm. They are experts quoting the constitution, laws, local and international. Oh my God, they used to blow my mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the permanent civil servant. Right. Wow. Didn't matter. Fisheries, agriculture, tourism, roads, what? They know their mm. stuff. It's okay. just that they get leaders on top of that. Oh. So, so I think we, we sometimes, because this is the way the world works, the, you know, a new leader comes, he brings his team. But the, the structure underneath, mm. they know their stuff. But okay. they will work to whatever you say. So if I say I want a mice department, mm -hmm. they could resist only in giving me facts. You know, historically, we've never been a conference destination. Historically, this is the number of flights that come into Kisumu. Da, 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 da. I say, right, if that's only the number of flights that come into Kisumu, we need to shift. I better go and get to the airlines and talk to them so I can get more airlines into Kisumu. Out I go. So... Um, that's just an example. And then working in blue economy was a big mm -hmm. thing under the former president's agenda. Yes. Climate change, you know. So then you adapt and you take what the national is doing and you uh, try and marry some of them into okay. the space. But a wonderful experience can be very chaotic too. Um, the corruption space that we talked about is also undertones of, and it affects, I mean, you hear the head of state also frustrated with it. Um, but that is a bigger conversation. That is... Kenyan going back to basics and started How from a very do young that? age. Now that you have I, insider knowledge. Yeah, I really, it is about, you see, if, the, if I as the minister in my docket closed the gaps on corruption, mm -hmm. I would, the staff would hate me for it because it was part of their DNA. Okay. But you can start to, it has to be a national call and usually the top leader would be the one, the clarion call. Working with the clergy, the, the, the what are they called? Members the of the cabinet church. And the cabinet. Oh, the church. You've got to bring everybody on board and say, we're not doing right. How do we fix it? Working with the educational institutions to start it, introducing yes. it in the schools at an early level. But most importantly, once you are occupying your population, they have jobs. Mm -hmm. You've created things to distract them from these pursuits. Mm -hmm. They can actually, industries have been put up. Organizations have been built. People are occupied between eight and five. You mm. will find my hard work will get me there. Then I don't have to do all these other underhanded things. It's true. Things. When, you, when you're hopeful. And, and because you're nobody, useful yes. during your hours on right. planet Earth. But if I'm not doing anything and I can see the world's latest Range Rovers and the latest Bentleys and, I, and I'm educated and I've got a degree or I've come out of the TVs. Mm. You know, you want that. And I don't have access. So, so... Uh, the current administration is talking about setting up industries and manufacturing and all of this. If we get people out of the, out of their phones, mm. doing a whole lot of, you know, social vices. Mm -hmm. If we get people off the streets, mm -hmm. if graduates, you know, so it, again, I go back to in uh, where is this Holland? They controlled the number of graduates that the number of students that go to the university. And they also controlled the departments that students would go into. So they would notice back then that this um, digital space was becoming a thing, mm -hmm. uh, that the phones were becoming a thing. So you would find a lot more emphasis and they would take more students into the sciences, oh. less students into the art, so that they are industry ready. Which is how Kenya used to, when my mother tells me about when they were going to university, that's how it was. Oh, she wanted to study law. 
but and my dad wanted to do something else but they were both geared towards teaching right. and they became teachers right. like they both have bachelors right. in education right. they didn't have a choice right. and because government is paying they're like this yeah, is you, the, sco- this this is the scholarship you, yes. if you don't want it yeah, yeah, then don't come <laughs> right Got do it. something else and then then i think that those are some of the things we are losing we have mm-hmm. lost here my observation having come back in i i see that we open so many universities mm. all over the country because you want to absorb those students who have made it but then what are you going to do with them in only 3 years time right most degrees are 3 years time yeah so if you brought all these people to do ba anthropology ba psychology ba sociology uh, science botany zoology mm-hmm. yeah you've ho- you're in a holding pattern for 3 years mm. graduation day comes and then what yes. what were the industry so what i noticed it was mm-hmm. amazing because you learn as you go through life When that child is 6, the government has projected what is this child doing in 12 years time. Mm-hmm. So they were always talking about the 12 year plan, the 12 year child, the 12 year child. Mm. I've arrived at nursery, I'm or primary, I'm 6. My government has already determined in 12 years time we need x number of doctors, x number of lawyers, x number of uh, So they're already looking at you yeah. and trying to figure out where yeah. do you fit. So not just take you... all of us into university, uh-huh. or all of us into uh degrees and we all come up with degrees but then there's no industry to absorb it. True. So how you can break down this culture, break up the dependency on corruption has to be that the state, the government is really serious about the building of industry, attracting mm. all these attracting all these international organizations here, make it that a uh, conducive business environment. Okay. The whole tax thing really affects businesses. So not making the ones who are here leave making mm. the ones who are here stay encouraging new ones to come through so all th- not theoretical these are the ways to do it right and it's hard the economy has suffered worldwide covid what it did wars that we're mm-hmm. fighting so and then it's really up, i my expression is leaders bring the weather oh i like When that i am the leader as the cc in kisumu for Trimble, i brought the weather they moved depending on how archi was if she was go 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 they were go 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 if i want new airlines if i want new this i want it to be a my uh, space i want to entice the nation media group to come and do kusi i want this mm-hmm. i want other cities i want but i bring the weather and people move with you so if your weather space is a little mute people will go that way if mm-hmm. your yeah leaders bring the weather and and I really think, i think i'll keep that keep that because i really think that Hashtag #leaders bring the weather i yeah. like that i like it that it really is what it is and okay. um, if you are just going to go through school go through university start a job and continue and you're not bringing you into the game the real you mm-hmm. you can only do that really when you're now at the top of your organization or the department but you bring the weather just like in your home mm-hmm. depending on the kind of uh, parent i am the kind of spouse i am i bring the weather Okay. The home functions if Archie is bubbly and energetic true. and whatever. Moms and especially yeah, bring the weather. You bring the weather. Okay. So in leadership it's about that. So corruption a, t- a tough topic to deal with. Um it, I know it uh, affects national government. They talk a lot about it and we have to give them their time to see how they can and to fix it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about motherhood. Now that you've mm. said mom also brings yeah. the weather. <laughs> motherhood. What do you want to know? Uh-huh. Did, when did it happen? First of all, all we heard about is the travel and yes, the Holland and, I, and, and uh-huh. after I heard that gossip in Shag, <laughs> we'll bring someone else. Yeah. <laughs> This one doesn't the, look like the other IVF. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other IVF. Oh so, around that time that's when it happened. Actually, it literally just happened. Uh-huh. I styled up and realized, "Oops. Yes. Oh yeah, I married somebody and perhaps we should Uh, and I checked in with him. Do you know the small matter of having children? Da da da. Small matter. So, because you really have to talk about it when you're living abroad, because you don't have access to childcare mm-hmm. the way we do in Kenya. You don't have the nanny, the, the mm-hmm. maid, the ayah. You don't have. Mm-hmm. So you really have to think about it. What it's going to do to the budget for the family? There, you know, if one person is out of work and how's yes, that? Yes, because you, know? you can't be globe trotting. No, not at the same pace anyway. Not at the anyway. same pace. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe one income has to go down because mm. mommy has to take on a new role as mommy. Da 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 da. So we talked about it. and and I have a daughter and a son and um three years apart and I don't know I hear women always saying oh it was natural it came naturally not the birthing um <laughs> talk about the whole motherhood experience uh-huh. no I found it uh, quite 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 challenging and when you read the books you realize actually a lot of women have a, a hard start um I think there's a lie that's told to us to make yeah. us mothers yeah <laughs> and I agree <laughs> I think there's a lie. You've got to be clear. <laughs> mm-hmm. You've got to know who you are in leadership in life. 
really know what, what, how does your mind work mm -hmm. in leadership and in life? I know how I am. I, I was never particularly child. I didn't really get them. I was the first one of six. Uh -huh. Maybe that exhausted me. So I kind of felt some sort of way. Because like when the maid's not there and you're the first one, you have to do stuff. Firstborn so. girls have an experience with motherhood. This yeah. is another reason why I wanted to ask you this question. <laughs> So, but I don't know that at that time. You know, you're just doing life mm -hmm. and you're living. And, and not really heavy. I mean, we did have the nanny, the cook, the drivers, blah, blah, blah. But I still feel that maybe somewhere there I didn't feel it. Um, or maybe I just wasn't mm -hmm. uh, like that. So, I, like, I would never, there would never be kids around and you'll see me go and hug them. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know how to talk to them or be with them. I liked looking at them, thinking, oh, that's a cute one. I like that outfit. and that. But not really. Some mummies, some girls just know how to be with kids and kids just go to them. Um... I like to say I think my kids are alive because their dad was there so actively. Oh. Children go to him. He's got a very heavy baritone. They go to him. He can be in a restaurant and he'll turn and he'll look at a kid who's crying, causing the same. The kid will look. Eventually the kid will come. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that throughout. That. As I've grown up, yeah. I see that in more and more men. Yeah. That men kids are more calmer with them. My brother teaches Sunday school. Oh. Kids just gravitate to him. Yeah. They've always loved him. My yeah. dad is the same. Actually, if there's a parent I felt I was depriving of grandchildren, it was right. my father, Your not even really my mom. Oh. My mom is, she's not cuddly. She's yeah. not like, oh, no. No, yeah. No. It's like, I, hi, I, mom. I, quick yeah. hug. Okay, we're, we're done. done. <laughs> yes. I, I wasn't cold, but I didn't come to, just like marriage didn't come naturally. I was thinking uh -huh. about it. Kids also. So when they came, it was quite traumatic. And then you're abroad, so you don't have care. Ah. So you're doing everything. It was quite hard. But everybody was doing it because you, you, you now have other mums with you uh, who become your friends. Um, I think I like to, not I think, I know I like kids when they start talking, like three. And then, then I know what to do with them. <laughs> and, I can, and, and, and I'm also, I'm very I'm big hungry. On, I yeah. need the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And I like to teach. Uh -huh. you, know, I, I, you know, if a kid's crying, causing a scene, it'll be like, is this glass half empty or half full? And we start like that. This, so I'm quite, I don't want to say intellectual with them, but I am. Okay. I, I'm not... Baby, baby, cry. No, it's very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've okay. found in my journey, mm -hmm. children are very okay with that. If you stimulate here, they're okay. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter where I am. In Kisumu with a kid who might have come that day to work with the mom because mom was taking him to the clinic or whatever, whatever. If I, over the age of three, if I was uh, <laughs> there, I'd pass and I'd say, hello, how are you? What's your name? I come down and to the level we talk and, and I'd be like, I can see they're distressing the mom and mom's still got to do some work before she actually leaves mm -hmm. and I have no problem with it. Leader bring the weather. I'm a woman. I'm yes. okay with a lady mm -hmm. having to juggle. And I'll give him a paper and a pad. I said, are you draw for me? I'm going for a meeting. When I come back, I want to see. Child sits down and does it. So it didn't come naturally, but I, I think I'm a good mummy. I'm certainly um, d raising them the way we were raised, very okay. academic and all of that. And uh, yeah, and they're very, very good peeps. They're all taller than me and... Life goes on. They're like, okay. Mom, you're the short one. We'll let you know what we're thinking. <laughs> How's the weather down there? But very fine, a very fine. But then very quickly, so they lived the international life, mm -hmm. moving from country to country, changing schools, meeting new friends. Speaking uh, many languages. Speaking many languages. Yes, yes, yes. Um, both very good. The father, there are four of us in this family. I'm the only one who doesn't speak. I don't take to languages easily. Oh. These are the three. Easy, easy, easy. Chinese, what? Doesn't matter. Which school was this? Which Lenana? And the lure that impressed your and dad. And the lure. And, 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 and uh -huh. like now Arabic. And, but that Arabic I'm finding quite comfortable as well. Um, I'd love to it, speak Arabic. Yeah, because it has a... It's like what Mombasa, you know, they've got Arabic in their mm -hmm. Swahili. And some of the words are like our Swahili words. Right. But mostly I just like their gestures. I think I, I like how... Uh, Arabs are like Africans. We speak with our whole body. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. You know, the, the English are very... Proper. Yes. Yes, stiff upper lip, that's how they are. I find that interesting now that I'm in communication because yeah. on TV, it's such a distraction. But in reality, yeah. like if, we, you know, we've met socially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hands All out. It. But when you're then, here, when you're here, it's like... You bring to it. center because you're irritating the, the Yes, audience. you're distracting yeah. from the conversation. So, so the expatriate life has uh, impacted them. Yeah, of course. You yeah. mentioned something called the third culture. What is that? Oh, yeah, the third culture. So you have your culture. I am a Kenyan... Af I'm an African Kenyan uh, woman. Uh huh. Um, remember, I didn't really know my language or tribe, but I knew I was a Luo, and mm -hmm. we know that. And tribe was not a thing for long. Tribe was not uh, in Kenya. It really wasn't. It has mm -hmm. become over time a thing. Pity, because you should just be one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the young guys are not interested in this tribe thing. Mm -hmm. I either get you or I don't, and your tribe has nothing to do with it. Thank God. 
uh, just love Gen Zs. And um, I found that moving them from different countries was my desire and my spouse's desire. Want to see the world, travel and see different things. And anyway, once you start the expats route, you tend to stay on it for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, and only when they grew up and when they would be older and very articulate in how they're explaining, they really found it very difficult. The constant changes, always crying oh. at the end of the term because we're now moving to another country. And equally, all the expat kids going through that. So expatriates are, are, oh. are, are another tribe also. They're always saying goodbye. You always say goodbye. Because if your dad's post is three years, you're going to move after three years. At the end of term, instead of, see you next term. See you at the end of the year. See you, see you in January or September. So you as a person don't have this thing of, I love this sofa. Let's buy art that we love because we're going to have it for I long. Couldn't have, I couldn't. Even plates and things. Because no. you're always like no. selling stuff and moving on yeah. and buying new things. Yeah. And I couldn't. I, I grew up in Kenya. So of course, same house. Okay. Church Road and then Loresho. Mm -hmm. Same house. Still there. So I know that life. But by my mid-twenties, I was gone. So um, what now? You, 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 you can't attach. But it took me time. Pain, tears, anger. I had to go for counseling, organized by Unilever. Go for training about what does expatriation mean? Thank oh. God there are very few companies that do it uh -huh. um, that really embrace and teach you what expatriation is. It's not just, I live in another country. How do you adjust to the people? When an Englishman says at work, um, that, that, that's really good. That's really good work. You know, well done. Um, you might want to look at just tweaking the last bit. The Kenyan, same thing, would be telling you, no, I don't like that. That's not good. You need to change it. The last bit is, is the most important. So it's just learning that these people are softer, but they mean this. The Dutch are very direct. Very direct. I do not like that at six foot six that they are. I don't like that at all. Can you redo it? Straight. So again, learning that each culture, each country, each people I think, are different. I think in another life I was Dutch. <laughs> okay. Me too. I'm quite direct. And I this find... Softy, softy, bores And me a lot of Kenyans are like, I, there's no, no... I think you just lived There's no board. preamble. In England. There's no... <laughs> Queensway. That's what sorted you on a different lane. Because uh -huh. yes, um, the Kenyan public are, as, as a people, we want to be spoken to softer. So you can imagine me coming into government. Government mm -hmm. people also want... To Kwanza, to, uh, all that stuff. Let me tell you, five years. I saw this Tuomba thing. At every meeting we have to pray, at the beginning at the end, you can have five meetings a day. So after a few weeks, I said to them, listen, pray in your homes. Are you the person who is cutting prayer out pray of government? in your <laughs> homes. When we come to work, we start like that. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you start. I didn't realize it's every meeting that there are prayers. Every meeting. Every meeting. If I have my first meeting at 8.30, we will pray. And the meeting will end, we will pray. The next meeting is at 11, we will pray. Even da, da, churches da, 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 da. don't do that. That's what you do in Gava. Even churches, you start at the beginning. The, the whole church organization, whatever, will have a... Mm. No. I was praying. I noticed. I was kind of, depending on my diary, I was praying four or five times a day. And even when you go to see your boss, you have to pray Did there. Did that change your spiritual life in any way? No, my spiritual life is fairly calm. I went uh -huh. to Consolata, so that's Catholic. Went to Musagari, that's Catholic. Uh, and I'm not Catholic. Um, it didn't change. I just found, I remember leaders bring the weather. I just thought, well, just pray at home. Come to work. <laughs> pray at home work. and come to work. <laughs> However, when I was with members of the public, mm -hmm. since the members of the public don't have to deal with me from a very official way, I have to endear myself to them. And they do a lot of the praying. So then, then you would then, pray. Okay. Yeah, no choice. Okay. Yeah. I did learn how to pray better as time went on. Okay. But my prayers, as my boss would often tell me, and my colleagues, was very business-like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, help us work. And she deals with God the way she deals with everybody yeah, else in the office. Yeah, it's very like, this is the plan. This is, what, what are you, you know, dear God, you know, help us to, you know, go through this meeting with structure and order. Let us achieve the objectives of which we have set out. And should you grant us our wishes, we will come back to you and say thank you. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Business. <laughs> Okay, Still you. talking to him. I do. I do. Sometimes people used to tell me, what do you look at when you're, when you, we keep seeing you looking up at the skies. I said, oh, I didn't even notice I was doing it. In time I realized, oh, that's kind of when I'm having a, a moment, a yeah. chat with God. Seize help. <laughs> and then, you know, seize your guy. You have to talk to God how you, it should not be too structured. And I think uh -huh. the, the younger generations just stop church. In Europe I was seeing nobody was going to church anymore. There was a disconnect between how the church was talking to the flock there was no connection. 
They were mm -hmm. not keeping up with the times and they were talking down to the people and the people are like, oh, go to school, I know better. Next. I know what you guys are doing in churches and all that stuff. So I just believe that you recognize that there is a higher being than you. Mm -hmm. Allow that higher being to guide your steps, your work, your life, your thoughts. Um, try and be a good human being above all mm -hmm. else. And that's pretty much it. And not very scripted. Okay. Spiritual, not religious. Okay. Mm, if there's a difference. So there's research showing, you know, men are called visionary, but yeah. women who seem to have a very clear plan for where they yeah. want an organization to go are called abrasive yeah. and all these things. Yeah. Dif very different adjectives sure. for similar behavior. Right. Did you experience that? Especially because Kenya can be, you know, patriarchal, misogynistic. Yeah. Yeah. So did go you experience that? <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Across the world. Uh, and it is what it is. And uh -huh. if you choose... As a, as a female, to go into leadership, to go into the corporate space, expect it, it's coming, deal. Don't have time for your dramas and your tears and all that. I really don't. I really don't. I really have no empathy. Are you now the, the, leader, no the female empathy, empathy with, the female Why? leader without empathy because now? Because uh -huh. once we bring in, now I have the, okay, I remember at the very beginning I was talking about how women go through their emotional, hormonal things. A when monthly thing, yeah, yes, and yes. And how that disrupts us. You know, you've, you've come into a space that was originally, mm -hmm. the provider was the male. Right. Spiritually, religious, time's gone, da, 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 da. And the female space was to be the homemaker, the softer side of humanity. Mm -hmm. And beautiful that was. Times have changed, and in each country it's different. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt, I still see a very feminine approach. There's still men still open. Yeah, it's very different. Kenya is, Kenya is real. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between a guy and a girl. And I don't mean the way they're dressed. I just mean in their manner and their behavior. Because the Kenyan female has had to be very strong to take on the male roles. Uh, they are the providers. Yes. I think we're losing something. Yes. That's that, yes. what you're saying, you can't tell the difference. I think we're losing something. As women, we're losing something. So I say to women, mm -hmm. uh, and I do talk around this space a lot. I'll be speaking at International Women's Day again. I'll bring up that topic for sure. You have to... You are one human being, but you must compartmentalize your life. Mm -hmm. Men do it. Women bring the same archie into how she was at home. She brings her archiness into how she's working in the office, when she meets her girlfriends in the evening, when she's going to apply for a promotion, she's bringing her archiness into them. Men are very clear. In the home, I'm like this. As soon as I've left the gate, I'm an our guy. And this is where women need to shift to. And around the world, they do. Just give yourself permission, now that you have the knowledge and the learning, maybe if you're listening to this video clip, mm -hmm. compartmentalize your life. Mm -hmm. And then you are not going to bring your emotions into every compartment of your life. So I'm very clear that when I leave home, as I was climbing up and becoming bigger, and I think, and I think once you are, if you're a mother, once the kids are stabilized, they kind of, in my view, it's kind of like when the last one is 10, you're kind of back to the girl you were before you became a mother. Okay. Because the emotional traumas of raising ch the child is a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is not only for women who are mothers. Of course, there are many women who are not mothers who are in the corporate space and also have emotional spit moments and whatever. Compartmentalize. When you leave your house, when I leave my house, I am that girl in the house and this one is not the same person at all. I'm expecting male aggression and I will get it. I'm expecting men to have been discussing in the evening when I was home and they were in the pub and club mm -hmm. and bars, something of the office, and things changed while I was at home. And then I come to the office in the morning and I find, ah, when did that change? Mm -hmm. Standard behavior. I'm expecting that they don't owe me anything. I'm expecting that the laws of my country are not yet in my favor. We've been looking for this two-third rule, president after president. Mm -hmm. um, I'm expecting the church is not bold enough to put their foot down and... I talk about the church because in Kenya and in Africa, the church is a very big voice, a very significant yeah. voice. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's coming. And so bring your testosterone to the table. Every female has a testosterone level. Yes. I just pump it up more during my day excursion. Like if you were a man, I'd be behaving slightly differently. Mm -hmm. I could. But I need to know that I'm acting. It's an act. I'm on stage. Humanity, we're on stage. It's an act how I am at home and how I will be at work. And that's specifically at work, what is the issue at that time? Mm -hmm. But as a female, we bring all of us to all of life. 
and then we get hurt. Then we get emotional. Then we get angry. We get tearful at work. We mm-hmm. other chicks are also being nasty to another chick. That female, uh, <laughs> that bad thing that mean goes girl. On. Yeah, bad, yeah, that thing. So I would say that how I learned in time, and could also ask my mom. Remember, I had that backup. Yes, kind of check in. Like, how does this work? And she was a mom of six kids. Very, very, very feminine lady mm-hmm. throughout her life. Mm-hmm. Very, very feminine to date. Um, and she would say, compartment, do, do, do things in sections. And I remember those days, sections. I was like, how do you do things in sections? Didn't know. So life will teach you. But I could remember words like those as I go along. Uh-huh. And then I, as time came on, I realized, oh, I can compartmentalize this thing. Okay. So as a young girl, you are a junior, you're a management trainee, a graduate trainee, or you're in plumbing and you've gone into a male space environment. You're in tech, still very male. Da, 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 whatever the space, engineers, male. Mm. You've got to recognize, be mindful of how your mind works. Mm-hmm. I'm here, I'm, like when I was a Waziri now, but I'm an older girl when I was a Waziri, so I could handle men differently. You had more experience. Because I was a leader, right, and also yeah. I was running that section. Mm. But I had a boss. Um, but even as growing up in the different cultures, you've got to just say, I don't need to bring my girly thing into this space. So what do I see in Kenya, for example? I see that girls here are always in suits, trouser suits. Or women in general in Kenya are always in trousers. Red, when you see a girl in a dress or a skirt, it says something without anybody having to tell you something. But public let transport me, let, in a dress is let, such let a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it like in Namibia and Botswana? Okay. And they're, they're all in public transport and they do, do wear dresses. When I was in advertising mm-hmm. in McCann Ericsson and we had to travel around the world and do our work, one of the things the, our bosses would teach us as the younger staff, was every time you arrive in a country, a region, an office, between, oh, let me talk about country, between when you land at JKIA, I've come mm-hmm. from outside, between JKIA and my hotel, that taxi driver will give you the pulse of that nation, mm-hmm. the vibe of those people. Let's say we go to Gishagi and I take a border, border, if, don't, but if, then that border guy will give you the lowdown. Sapa niaji, what's happening? He'll give you, by the time he's dropped you off, you've got the, lo- the lie mm. of the land. Pay attention to it because it will give you the tone, the tonal energy of that country or that mm-hmm. region. Another thing they would tell us to do is pay attention to the advertising. Remember, we were in advertising. Billboards, especially. Some countries don't do billboards. Canada, for example, has no time. They want you to see the greenery and whatever. Kenya, I think, is inundated. It's too much. It's too much. It's untidy. The visual corruption is heavy. The driver is distracted the whole mm-hmm. time. My personal view. So when you're driving into, again, airport to the city, and you look at a billboard of paint, mm-hmm. it will be sexualized. It will have a cleavage moment. or have, It will. Just look. Mm. Um, the same Dulux or, I don't know, crown paints or whatever. If you mm-hmm. saw it in another country, nah. It wouldn't be the same, same thing. Same message, but it will be. So you can tell the tone of a country very quickly or a region by its um, visual representation. Mm-hmm. And so also look at the people as you're in the car, the cab, driving to your hotel. And in Kenya, I know a lot of my expat friends would always tell me that. Um, most women, 99% of the women are in trousers. Tells you something. It's got nothing to do with tra- public transportation. It means on the public transportation, we are these women unsafe. are harassed. We are unsafe. So that tells you that the tone of that country is the women's issues are not in check. They're not, they're not um, prioritized. Yes. And yet you go into another country, same thing. There are also matatus everywhere. Mm-hmm. Women are in skirts and dresses. Rwanda, totally different behavior. So yes. uh, also the way the women dress. In Rwanda, the I, men was, dress. I was so pleasantly surprised by the men. So, so polite. I was like, so oh. Egypt, same. <laughs> so, so it depends. It depends. It really is. And I don't want to knock my country down, but there's so much to do here. No, but we, we if we don't we say are. these things, if Who's we don't acknowledge, because you have to look at something, you have to confront something to deal with it. So you, mean, have, you, know, you have to say this is what I'm looking at. Yes. And I think that the women are, again, they've compartmentalized and decided, I can't wear these pretty dresses because I don't live in a society where men respect me. So I will wear these trousers. And now that I'm in my trousers suit, when I show up at work, I'm also not going to bring my femininity to it. Because mm. for why? I also want that job the same way this guy. So there's a lot of aggression at work. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of roughness. There is rough. To us as women. Mm. Yeah, we're a bit loud. Mm-hmm. We, yeah, that almost Jeez. jostling with the dudes. Yeah. Don't yeah. do things. We don't allow men any space to do things for us. Even because basics. like When mm-hmm. we do allow them, 
Kenyan women will say they disappoint them. Right. So women have learned. Mm -hmm. Women are providers more than the men. When we first, so my brother and I lived, oh, he's a year younger than me. Right. So I went to the UK before him and then the next year, so we flew in together. Right. And, um, you know, the second time. Yes. Yeah. Getting from Heathrow now to the hostel and everything. And we're walking, so we dump our bags and we're walking through London like we need to right. run errands. And he's just like, wow, wow. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Yes. He is 17. Yes. He's never seen this much leg. <laughs> yeah, He's my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. He was like, all these guys. <laughs> we on the train. We on the bus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and he's like all yes. these thighs, yes. and it was August, September, you know, yeah, yeah, before all, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's just like mini skirts all over. <laughs> I'm nobody really harassing. It. Nobody harassing, and I said, and even then, I was like, it's because they feel safe. Yeah, because they feel safe. And so we, you started femininity. How do how mm -hmm. are we as women, and how do we we are told we are aggressive and whatever? And I tell the women, just accept it. I was told I am bullish, I'm arrogant, I'm proud, I am, you use any adjective you want. And I'd be like, ain't gonna change my paycheck. Because what do you do? You cannot talk to men about, please understand that when I am pushing for something at work related to work or a project, and my colleague is also pushing, let's say we're in, you know, we're both colleagues and we've got to pitch our stories. Mm -hmm. You're both Waziris, you want oh, a budget, yes. right? Yes. He has a, we're both he has a concept. A company and, a, yeah. right. His will be told, I like the way you're aggressive and you push about it. Uh, the lady will be told, as we know, you'll be told, oh, you're a bit too pushy. So here's the places you can change. Tonal changes. Mm -hmm. Because the audio, the way a man hears a woman's voice is different. So don't do this high shrilly thing that girls do. Bring mm. your voice down. <laughs> You have to operate at a corporate level and be, become, remember, you bring your testosterone to the game. And you bring your facts. I'm going to have to practice this. Oh, I bring do it all your the time. voice down. My happy da, 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 is with the girls. Bring me into a work environment, I bring it down. Because I learned it. Once you learn, you know, you plug and play. You bring you're, your you're tone down. You're going to down. watch me bring my voice down. Uh -huh. <laughs> you bring it down uh -huh. and it slows down also. Men listen slowly. Girls, when we're talking, 16 million things at a time and you've it's got true. all of them. Because you're a girl, you're hearing a girl. Men are just, you know, our husbands will always say that. Or a boyfriend will always say, well, I don't know. She said so many things. I don't really know what. They listen slower. Huh. And they select what was the most important thing. So therefore, present first the most important thing. This is at work. And then your backup. And stop feeling silence. Mm -hmm. There is strength in pauses. Don't feel it. When you've put your case in a relationship or at work. And this is what I'm pitching for. What I'd like to do is, and the facts are this, if you look at document 16, remember tonos is down, da, da 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 So what I want is this. And then there's a pause. That pause is not because the men are calculating something underhanded. It is just working its way through their system. It is science. Let them have their moment, especially if your boss is male, your peers, if they're particularly male, and then sit back. Put your back against the chair and mm -hmm. let the pause sit. Somebody will inevitably speak. Don't break the silence. Because women, we will be like, I hope you understood what I was saying. If I can repeat what I was saying was, and, and, and now it's chaos for the male. Just go slow. A lot of hesh for the man. Respect that he is male. Do. I, and, and I do that. I do respect that. I'm, if I'm speaking to a man, I will behave. I'll give him his space for a moment. I'm going to try this, actually. Yeah. And then I'm, going to tell you how it, I'm going to tell you how it went. Every time. Respect first that they are speaking to a male. Aha. Uh -huh. Even that, you know, like um, sometimes you get, I drive quite fast, so I get caught by these cops a lot. And this is when I say about using my femininity, the one God gave me, mm -hmm. not my sexuality, mm -hmm. my femininity, two totally different spaces. Right. Using the fact that I am a female. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get caught by the cop. cop. And, it's how you, and he's male. You're going to behave different. You have to. Because if it's a chick, you have to be different. You have to compartmentalize. So with the cop guy, you're like, if you can do the shame thing, you know, sasa. And, and then the guy says, you know, I said, then you start. Yeah, I know. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean it. I'm really sorry, actually. Yeah, you're right. I did that. And I, if you can do it in Swahili or whatever. And I don't need to do that again. I am really sorry. And I can see you're really hot. Can I give you this bottle of water? Femininity. You just... 
Mm-hmm. But I'd, I'd do that to I, a girl. I, I get confused when there are two and it's a man and a woman. Yeah. And then I'm like, the, no. The, they would be address the female. <laughs> Best you address the female. Best mm-hmm. you address the female. Because that female will make that male cop keep quiet. No, you address the female. That's true. Yeah. Sadada. But you know, madam, you're driving her. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm, really, I'm sorry. Her, Give her her space. <laughs> recognize her as a human being. And sometimes you'll be like, I know you're going to find me and whatever, but I love your earrings. Anyway, Sasa, what do we do? No, I'm just saying, yeah. And, and often, if you're gentle to the male, gentle to the lady, it's how you approach them. Okay. Say, okay. okay, we'll let you go. And I said, I also don't have cash and I don't do M-Pesa. And so now I don't know. Mm-hmm. Can't help you. I think okay. you're just going to have to give me a ticket. But I'm really sorry. I didn't mean it. Be kind. Okay. What's the aggression for? Be there kind. will be times aggression is required. But mostly, drop the tone. Respect your audience, male or female. And allow poses to sit. Say the first, the most important thing comes first. Mm-hmm. And then whatever. For females, we do the build up. We do the small, and here's the big one. So it's really just learning how to bring all of you. Also, try and recognize that uh, is this a week where I'm not feeling great? I'm in pain, tummy mm-hmm. issues, da, 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 da. So is there a way I can move this meeting to another time? To another time. I, I refuse to clear. negotiate. On but you know, when on you're younger, you don't have a choice. It's you're true. Still a young it's girl. true. You don't set your environment. Yeah, it's true. You, this environment is set for you. But it is always about being courteous. So, so aggression. Being told you're this, that, you're arrogant, you're pompous, you're a bitchy, blah, 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 blah. sit with it. No problem. So, yeah, okay. I, I hear you. <laughs> because they're going to say it. They're going to say it. But over time, once the content of what you're talking about is mm-hmm. robust, you've learned your stuff, you know how to put it across and whatever, I see that men just step back and they give you your space. Mm-hmm. But it's over time when you're climbing up. Okay. To wrap up. Yeah. Your life sounds idyllic, mm-hmm. but I'm sure there's been, it's life. It yeah. does its thing. I'm sure there's been a shaking. Yeah. Um, how do you cope with that when things go left? Has right. something happened that has gone, you know, completely, yeah. you know, of course, rug ripped out from under you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I call it turbulence. Okay. Um, yeah, of course. And how do you deal with turbulence? Turbulence can be in the professional setting as well as in the personal in setting. In your marriage. Let me talk about home. the mm-hmm. personal setting. The only way that I say that people should deal with turbulence, mm-hmm. especially women, but both, is go for, you know, traditionally in African culture, in our environment in Gishagi, there was, bom- in the Boma, there was auntie, there mm-hmm. was Uncle Nani, and we kind of all lived around each other. There was a village elder, there was right. all these structures, there was the priesty kind of churchy man. There was all this, the structures, and, and so people were not moving into bigger spaces. It was mm-hmm. all a fairly contained space. And when there was a problem in marriage, with children, not giving birth, whatever the problems are, you had a village mama to go and talk to. Right. There was a grandma. Mm-hmm. Those were counselors. Mm-hmm. We just didn't use that word. You went to Auntie Nani, mm-hmm. Shosho preferably, the older, older lady of the environs. And you went and shared. Mm. And that lady had the powers, or the gentleman, to call the other spouse. And then to try and do dialogue. Mm. Because they were building a unit, the whole environment, right. traditionally. Yeah? And over time, because of uh, the, the way economies evolve and people mm-hmm. move into the urban areas out of you know, the rural urban migration and setting up of cities, all those structures fall apart. In, uh, especially in our African culture, we have not tried to retain them. Uh, we should, but we haven't. And like I'm, when I'm in the Central America, South America, the, I see that they still have those cultures. The counseling systems of their country, they have the professional ones, the graduate who is a counselor, who's the right, nana, nana, psychologist, nana, working all that. side mm-hmm. by side with the traditional counselors of that community, side by side. It makes sense yeah. because you have this scientific background, yeah. psychology wise, yeah. how the brain works, how to communicate, all that stuff. But then there's a very deep cultural yes, element of the people. Of the people. Yes, yes. So I found that very intriguing in South mm-hmm. America that they do that mm-hmm. as part of government. And these people, like at the Kenya is devolved, at the village level, uh, in the villages, that person exists and is on the government paycheck. Okay. She's just a show show. But they know how to talk. They recognize issues how value. Yeah. So back to the issue. I, I say go for counseling. Mm-hmm. You must go somewhere to talk. Because it is the keeping it in that makes men go into depression and into suicide. Mm-hmm. For women, it takes the same toll, but not as strong. We 
because we're mothers and we are women, we, we talk more, mm -hmm. we get a little bit of it out. Go for counseling. Now, how do you find a safe counselor is also the problem. Yeah, I listen in Kenya and people would often say, counselors also gossip and talk. So move into an environment where you don't live. So if I live in Westlands, then I'm not going to look for a counselor. That's exactly what I did when I was looking for a therapist. Go yeah, on. Uh -huh. to go far. If, if I'm in Westlands and I'm looking for a counselor, I'm not going to look for anybody around here. Mm -hmm. I'll look for somebody in Karen or I don't know. So that's exactly what I did. My therapist um, was in Karen. Yeah. I used to go see her at 6. I, actually, no, I'd start my day at 6 and I'd be her first appointment yeah. at 8 a.m. She yeah. used to find me in her reception. <laughs> Waiting. Waiting. <laughs> and because you wanted confidentiality? She's white. Yep. So, not in my circles. Yep. Yep. And yeah, that's what I wanted. I didn't that's want someone I'm going to bump into. Talking your stuff. <laughs> So you have to seek, so those, uh, the ethics of, because I trained to be a counselor at some point in my life. Okay. Um, and, but actually what I wanted to do was coaching. But in the UK, you had to do a, a season of counseling uh -huh. to understand how to speak to people. And even now I am just putting in my papers to be an accredited um, court mediator. I oh. went for training and did all that. And now I'm submitting my papers, waiting then to go for an interview. So that, again, the courts of Kenya are full, too many cases, uh -huh. the judges are overwhelmed, and they're introducing... They're such a backlog. Yeah, right. so mediation and how do mediators, again, That's come and amazing. bring people together. I like that you're constantly evolving. evolving. Yes. Yeah. Remember, I think it goes back to you have a... From childhood, learning was standard. Right. There was a professor daddy and... Or maybe it's just an interest... Okay. No, it's not an interest. It, you know, I have to evolve. And I get stuck. So after I did my five years in government and chose not to go back for the next five years. Mm -hmm. um, Why did about, you choose not to go back? I think uh, leaders evolve. Okay. I, I like this expression. I learned it. Um, I, I did a, a women in leadership program mm -hmm. at Oxford University also last year. Okay. Incredible. Brought me up to speed on what women leaders are going through mm -hmm. internationally. What are the pathways? What else to do? How do we... All of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. At the Said Business School at Oxford. And, and then I also did the mediation. So learning, important. I was saying something about... I've lost my train of thought. You were saying something about evolving and why it's important that, yeah. that you had something... You why I didn't go quote. back. I think uh, that was your question. Why oh, didn't I yes. go back to government? Um, I like an expression that I learned at, in school at, at Oxford, which said, um, people don't leave companies... They leave leaders. They, yeah, they leave, like, yeah, they leave managers. <laughs> yeah, because that person has a direct effect on how you feel. Yes, no, 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 no. daily. Daily. They can impact you feeling great or down or neutral, whatever. So there's that. But um, mostly it was, am I growing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think those are, those are the behaviors of people who come from the private sector. Right. Because I think if you're in government from start to finish, you just stay. I think. So it was that, um, number one. Number two, there was also the fact that my husband was working in another country and I wished to, to, to move and, okay. and, and join him. So, but I also then also had a desire to, having done county, mm -hmm. I also had a dream, still have it, um, to do something nationally for Kenya. Okay. So whether it happens now or tomorrow or it doesn't. You mm -hmm. still have to have a dream. CS tourism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or not even tourism. It can be any. It can could be, be any. It yes. Because it really, remember, you have a solid uh, public service under you. Right. The, the, as I said, the permanent and pensionable guys in government mm. are, my God. And I have done the international world. So I've met sharp people. And so you're, you're impressed here. by civil servants Don't in Kenya. Those guys. I they love that. On it. Mm -hmm. Every sector. Hesh to those guys, man. Very they're educated. Very, very Actually, every time adept. I interact with... Yes, I'm yeah. thinking about that. It's true. And they're true. very humble. They have to be. Mm. Um, because they're public servants. But, what? So, yes. Um, those were the dreams. Move to the other country. Um, maybe, can I go national? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Have okay. I outgrown this job? And what more can I do? Absolute last question. So, I've just remembered this. I'd forgotten to do it. We had... Uh, so, I'm asking each guest yeah. to leave two questions right. for mm -hmm. the next guest. Mm -hmm. So, our last guest yeah. left these questions. Okay. And she didn't know it was you who right. was the next, because you know her. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know her. Okay. Um, okay. What... She sent me a few questions. Uh -huh -huh. What will it take for Kenya to reach the ascribed 10% women in leadership? Mm -hmm. And what should serious contenders do? Mm -hmm. I'll answer that. 
Yes, and then tie, well, she suggested we tie in the theme for International Women's Day, but we don't have to. Okay. Um, uh, what I want to know is what, what will it take for Kenya to reach the ascribed 10% women in leadership and what's, what should serious contenders do? It'll take the head of state. Making oh. a decision. Taking it through the ministry of, I think there's culture, gender, ministry. Mm -hmm. Tasking that minister to mm -hmm. look into that. Um, purposing it as, as a priority for his, because Kenya has a male you know, president. Yes. Him deciding that, that needs to happen. The two-thirds, because I think that's what she meant is the two-thirds, yes. Tasking the minister to get on with it as a priority. Because, you know, as a leader, he has many things to do. He has to prioritize a few. He can't do it right. all. But it is if that came up higher into his priority list, mm -hmm. tasking that person, the leader of uh, gender, to handle it, and then the process starts. Okay. Public participation. What have we not done? Because they've, they've done it so many times. That they have. Are, nah, it's just not moving. They even have the names of women. Simple, straightforward <laughs> answer. Mm -hmm. My answer is what will it take to introduce the two-third gender rule is a directive from the head of state okay. to his team to get it looked at and achieved. And then women for the rest of time will always celebrate that under so-and-so, this happened. that's how we get it. Yeah. He's got a lot on his plate. So easy. Thank you, Archie. Thank you. We're done. <laughs>